You're listening to the Tumbling Saber Podcast, a member of the Star Wars Commonwealth Podcast Network. Check us out on the web at StarWarsCommonwealth.com, on iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter, and take your first step into a larger world. Everybody, welcome to episode 64 of the Tumbling Saber podcast. My name is Kyle. I'm Corey. I'm James. Or Jim, sorry. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, we're off to a wonderful start here. Way to go, guys. Um, yeah, welcome to episode 64, guys. Glad you're here, here with us this week. Uh, a light news week, but uh, trust us, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to pack this show for you. We're going to have some fun. And uh, we're gonna, we're going to start things off with the most fun thing ever, James. Why don't you recap your turn your curling tournament? It was the most fun thing ever. Uh, well, until we <laughs> lost. Um, yeah, we, we we curled. We threw a few stones over the last couple of weekends. Called the Lakeshore Tournament uh, here in the Montreal Greater Montreal area. A bunch of clubs, uh, lots and lots of teams, dozens and dozens of teams. Um, it's fun, man. So you show up at every club and like. There's tournament action going on. There's a whole bunch of games on every sheet. And there's like food being served, and everybody gets a, a, a meal as part of their thing. And like, so the club sort of takes pride in doing something a little different and taking good care of you. So like, you talk about them the most. So everybody gets treated really well over, through the whole thing. That might be the most fun part of it. It usually is, right? It's usually the, the, the of course, there's always the sport itself, but it's, it's always the other stuff, the social aspect that ends up being why you stay. Yeah, and curling's full of good people. Curling, curling people are like, uh, usually either athletes, believe it or not, athletes or, or often ex-athletes, like older, older people who used to be really good at like football and soccer and stuff, and now they curl. Uh, not that it's, <laughs> the other thing about curling that's really misunderstood, we'll, we'll uh, get off this, uh, this stone in a second, but the sweeping part of curling is really actually pretty athletic. So if you are athletic, you're, you'll be more useful as a curler than if you're not athletic. Yeah, curling gets a bad rap. Ah, oh, it's look, it is what it is. It's I'm not I'm not going to pretend it's it's more of a sport than it is either. But but the sweeping part, I mean, certainly if if you can sweep hard and, and for a long time, you're you're better at curling than if you can't. Must be, it must build incredible forearm strength with all, all that sweeping. <laughs> uh yeah, you know what it is. It's it's uh my back and shoulders that hurt the first couple of games every year. Yeah. And, and again, it's one of those sports that really lends itself well to a uh, a mug of beer. Oh, that so the like built into curling, the winning team when you come off the ice buys a round of drinks for the losing team. You all sit together, and then the losing team reciprocates. That's standard. Doesn't matter if like you know some people drink coffee or or pop or whatever. Most people drink beer, but like it's drink of your choice, and the winners buy for the losers one round, no matter what. Even if you're you're bolting out after, you stay for the first one. You, you don't have to take your second one. Very nice. Yeah, you know it's uh. It, it is a very social sport, so that that part of it's really cool. Yeah, and we lost uh, early. We didn't make it to the uh, medal round, so we're moving on. <laughs> the hell with curling. <laughs> yeah, curling sucks. Yeah, it's, curling it's kind, stinks. <laughs> it's kind of funny you you mentioned that. Like, I'm like, what does my life come to? Saturday morning, I wake up. It's like eight thirty <laughs> in the morning. It was exciting. I look at my phone. There's there's twenty notifications on my phone. So someone's live tweeting their curling game. <laughs> and he's like, "Yeah, you're up." Yeah, and then I was like, oh, "You just got too close to the sun, man." Yeah, we did. We were do- we were looking Corey, good for a while. Corey, you're a father. Like, who do you think you are, getting up at eight thirty in the morning, being a dad? Yeah, what's wrong Dude, with my you? My kid's awesome. He crawls right into bed with us. Just, just chill. Turn on the TV. He'll poke me a few times. Like, are you getting up yet? I'm like, ten more minutes. It's like cool. <laughs> yeah, mine aren't mine aren't there yet. We're more on the 5 a.m. schedule. Yeah, with three of them, I can imagine. Even two. Well, James, you and I, I think yesterday we were exchanging messages in the 5 or 6 o'clock hour on Saturday morning. <laughs> yeah, it sounds about right. Well, we're probably both prepping for the show tonight, Kyle. Well, of course. We, we never stop. <laughs> the hamster wheel never stops turning at Tumbling Saber. Never. I, I, 
<clears throat> I can't wait to hear this stuff because I looked at the show notes and I was like, oh boy. Well, we see we, we've, we're five minutes in and we're, and we're kind of stalling. This is, this is the magic. When you don't have a lot of news to talk about, you talk about other things. Like curling. Yeah, like curling. At least like you kind curling. of sold me on the whole, uh, the whole beer aspect of curling. That sounded fun. You'd like that part, Corey. You yeah. drink, Corey? Uh, every Sunday, anyhow. Oh, that huh. was literally your cue to open a beer. I'm already, it's already open. You know, as as delicious as beer is, it, it, I'm, it, it holds no flame to the deliciousness of the Reese peanut butter cup, which I am enjoying right now. Amazing. Wow, that's Dude, like you you're, know, you're putting uh, grain against chocolate, and that is a tough choice. Mmm. Yeah. Indeed it is. We'll come back to that. Right now well. it's not a choice, though. Yeah. It is a pleasure. That is Eat that is one Reese's. of the top top three chocolate bars. If if I got a name, the Reese's peanut butter cup gets gets. It's not even a chocolate bar, and it, it gets into the top three. Uh okay. So what else we got here? Oh, real sad news is uh, this morning we kind of realized that we'd lost one Bill Paxton. That is a a rough one, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you guys caught the news, I assume. Yeah, I I was I happened to be on my phone and I caught it right away. I was like, oh, dude, just tell me this is some kind of sick joke, like please. Yeah, that's that's too bad. Twister for yeah, me. I mean, I mean, there's. I know there's. Everybody's got, and and I guess Chet too. Like as a secondary, like honorable mention from from uh, Weird Science. But uh, yeah. But Twister for me is like, that's the Bill Paxton role, and man, I always like to be so, such a likable f- face character in most roles. Most. most. Often a scene stealer too. Yeah. I mean, I, I look for all of his great roles, whether it's Alien or. Now, he was in Titanic, I believe. Uh, Twister, of course. Uh, I know where you're recently, going with he... this. <laughs> Do you know? I think so. Uh, more recently, he was in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., where he had a pretty good turn as a, a villain. Uh, but one of my... uh, Actually, Apollo 13 as well. Really liked him in Apollo 13. I just I love that movie. Uh, Terminator, he had a brief role. Big Love. It was an HBO series. But Polygamous. Hatfield and McCoys, was he in that too? Yeah. Uh, but it, it's really the used car salesman from True Lies. Of, yeah, I knew it. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. We're trying to be a family show here, so we won't really get into the uh, the real funny stuff. But, uh, yeah. No, he will He will certainly be missed. Yeah, certain young, bombshell. man. 61. That's too young. Way too young. Way, way too young. I'm kind of curious to find out what happened. I heard it was complications due to surgery, but, you know, I guess it's really none of our business at the same time. But anyway, just a shame. Yeah, an absolute shame. I mean, the guy still had so much left to give, I think. Yeah, he just started a new show on, uh, I, can't, I don't, can't remember what Oh, network, Training Day, that's training right. Day, yeah, 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 Training Day. Man, oh, man. That's rough. So, so long to that show, I guess. Uh, but definitely, uh, rest in peace, Bill Paxton. He will certainly, my goodness, will he ever be missed. And, um, hey, we got three reviews. Actually, two new reviews, and one that I omitted to read way back when. So, uh, do any, either of you guys have these show notes in front of you? I can in about faster than Corey. Ooh. Boom, I'm there. Bastard. <laughs> All right, well, which one of you has better eyesight to take the first one? Uh, Go for it, James. Yeah, <laughs> the first one being small. from our good friend Paul Corey. So I have to issue an apology here. He 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 dropped this one, Jesus, coming up on two months, and I completely forgot about it. Uh, so thank you, Paul Corey, Paul Coruscant, I believe. And um, yeah, James, why don't why don't you read what uh, Paul had to say about the show? All right, I got it here. Uh, you're right about the eyes, though. Uh, what the heck why is that so small I screen capped it and dropped it in the show notes I, on my phone I honestly I can't make it big enough I'll read the other two if you want but I, I can't uh... All right, Corey can you read it I can try yeah, let me just bring my laptop a little do or do not me. man do or do not I'm going to screenshot what this looks like on my phone and you'll, you'll, you'll be like oh yeah no of course you can't do that James yeah if you're looking on your phone you have no chance alright so I'll go for it Title says it all. If you are Star Star Wars, 
and podcast fam, these Canadian gents will really have you laughing. With insightful looks into all things Star Wars, you never come away feeling you never come away feeling anything but enthralled and happy. The lads are engaging, witty, thoughtful, and funny. They are also part of a larger community called the Star Wars Commonwealth, where there are a bunch of Star Wars pods, all to, all great to get into, and each providing something different to get stuck into. Keep up the awesome work, boys. It's a pleasure since I stumbled upon, since I stumbled into your pod through the ever impressive Talk Star Wars, Paul. Beautiful. Wow. Dude, five star I review there. A five star do? review of your five star review. I, I could barely see this thing, and I had it, I had my laptop right in front of my face. <laughs> it's a it's a screen grab. Anyway, thank you, Paul. Uh, sorry, I, I left this out way back when. That's that's typically not what I what I aim to do here. And uh, James, you, I, I think you can probably make out better with the second one. Oh, easily, yeah, no problem. The other the other two are like legible and and big enough to read. Uh, so another five star review coming from some uh, unknown person that we'll name later. Uh, remember <laughs> thinking about Star Wars and talking about it with your friends. The tumbling Saber takes that feeling and bottles it up for you and uh, bottles it up for your podcasting consumption. Basically, it's awesome sauce. Uh, by one uh, C can die dough music. Uh, so we don't know him. He's probably not related <laughs> to Mister uh, Carlos Candido. Um, <laughs> But uh, thank you to that uh, strange gentleman uh, for your awesome review. It's awesome sauce. I've heard of him before. <laughs> He's a huge, huge 3PO lover. <laughs> Candido loves oh. 3PO. Candido hates him. Something like that. I think you can delete reviews once you put them. So let's not <laughs> poke the bear too much, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good analogy for Mr. Candido, actually. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Well, uh, Carlos, thank you, sir. Much appreciated. Yeah, all joking aside, thanks a lot, man. Uh, he's he's also a podcaster, so he gets he gets exactly what goes into to putting a show out every week. And so, a five star review means a lot. Thank you, man. It means an awful lot. As does this review, titled "The Magical Men of the North." I like that. We should maybe we should just rename rename the show. It, it, the someone might have, yeah. Five star review. I found the Tumbling Saber podcast the best way through a recommendation of another excellent podcast that I trust, and I've been in love with them ever since. These boys have a launch. These boys have a launch, a lovely natural friendship, and their banter is great fun. They have an encyclopedic knowledge of Star Wars that's both great, fun, and engaging, and they have some brilliant takes on all things Star Wars. They are appointment listening, and I recommend them wholeheartedly to any and all Star Wars fans out there. I'd give 10 stars if I could. Check them out. Wow. Coming from from the Emerald Isle, one Dave Donovan. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank you, everybody, for dropping yeah, reviews. Everybody, Paul. Wow. Can, can Dido? <laughs> I think it's about high time that uh, we bring in another night. And uh, I, I think we should take a few minutes here to uh, welcome to the knighthood one of our good friends who's who's really helping us out lately and, and, and having his input across the Commonwealth. Uh, let's hear it for one Matt Keegan down in Australia. Um, I, I, again, very supportive guy. Hey, here, here. Yeah, here, like here man. Good dude. Yeah, seriously. Have you seen how well this guy can draw? It's insane, man. Uh -oh. Well, that, that's what I was going to draw. He's, he's like Jedi master drawing. It's it's ridiculous. Corey's going to be hitting you up for some comic book stuff. <laughs> hey, if we Well, no, 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 not not that kind of drawing, like photo real stuff. Oh, it's really? Staggering. Oh, it's yeah, it is. He uh, did his bike oh, a few things, biker scout. His profile pic, I believe, must be something he had drawn. He did. Get out of here. Yeah. Yeah, man. Find find the full size picture of that, like click on his avatar a couple times, blow that baby up. He drew that. N okay, I'm wow. Well, Go, find his Instagram page. Go find his Instagram page. Um, yeah, the work is, is, is stupid. It's an, it's unbelievable. He did a probe droid recently. He did a biker scout for his kid. Really nice. Yeah, you, I think his most recent is a, is a Scarif uh, shore trooper. It's it's jaw-dropping. Uh, maybe it is the, the, the shore trooper, not the biker scout. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it's the shore trooper that you're thinking of. It's yeah, it's it's, it's I'd pay money for that good. 
Wink, wink there, Matt. Yeah, no doubt. Oh, yes. uh, totally a skill I wish I had con continued developing as a kid. Yeah, you were not that I ever actually got... quite good. You were no, pretty good. Not, not even close. Not even a tenth of that. No, but when you were that, you were young, man. And so was I. But you, you were good. <laughs> you were young, Kyle, once, and so was Corey, by the way. <laughs> no, but like to be that good at that young of an age, like I'm talking, like Kyle was probably like twelve, and he had a pretty good knack at it. Knack of it, you know, like. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I worked at it pretty hard back in that day, but, um, and, you know, you hit teenage years, you you think about other stupid stuff, and things fall apart. Girls, da 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 all I really want is girls, da Oh, well, sorry. Like, just like your eight, 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 this is an incredible story, kind of, um, 800 pound po uh, prods. You, you've obviously been dealing or speaking with him lately, Kyle, and he's allowed you to use, uh, as your cover image, one of his latest pictures that he's dri drawn, right? Correct. So I had a conversation with him recently because we were talking about the the old comic book magazine called Wizard. And Kyle and I, we used to buy this magazine, I think kind of religiously from about episode or issue eight till maybe about 20. And then, I don't know, we just stopped, I guess. But in that time, there was always this uh, this fan section for kids to to send in their drawings, right? So Kyle and I, being of that age, and we we're always, always drawing superhero stuff at that at that time. Like we, like basically, uh, Mike Pascal, I believe his name is Michael Pasquale. Pasquale, sorry. Um, he he drew this Spawn thing with the wizard hat and all that, and I remember that image. I must have been what fourteen years old, same as him. He was fourteen when he drew this thing, so we're most likely the same age. And he submitted it. It got put in the magazine. And then he retweeted it uh, about maybe two weeks ago. And I saw it online. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, I totally remember this. Like, he's like, really? I was like, yeah, for real. And Kyle as well. You remembered as well, no? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, that was in, like, the the waning years of our comic book collecting. But I definitely remember that. And I, I'm definitely going to be buying a print or two of his. I think supporting these these independent artists is is a good thing to do. So I'm going to do that. Um. Yeah. So there there you go, guys. A couple new knights to the Commonwealth uh, joining the the ranks of Ads and Carlos Connor, uh, Steve One Five with the Gen X Wing crew. I, may, I wish I had actually put together a full list of Dave all the Donovan. Knights. Don't forget Dave Donovan. Kyle. Yeah, Dave Donovan. Sure. Um. Yeah, we, we've got a bunch now. Some of the good people that uh, do really good stuff for the for us at the Commonwealth. Dave, so, sent, Dave sent me this. Uh, sorry, I've just well, before we, we walk away and we're still tangenting a little bit. Dave sent me this idea this week with a picture of Luke Luke Skywalker wearing a, a Gandalf outfit, like Gandalf the White holding his sword. And he's like, imagine if every time Gandalf disappeared in the story, he was taken off to a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> he had he had tangented out this whole like alternate reality. <laughs> that's a little mashup and never hurt anybody. No, and that's that's how big a fan he is. He's a, he's just as big, if not bigger. A, a, a well, I won't speak for him, uh, I, but I'd be curious to ask him if you you know to choose um, which fandom uh, he thinks he he would pick between the two Star Wars and Lord of the Rings. I think he'd have a hard choice. I don't know if he's a bigger Lord of the Rings fan or a bigger Star Wars fan. And his brother Again. just met J.J. J. J. Abrams, like, last week. Nice. Yeah. Dude, Gandalf is totally chilling with Yoda in the astral plane, no doubt. Yeah, I could see that. They'd get along. Gandalf's mad old, dude. He's, like, a few thousand years old. Yeah, he'd be calling him Young Master Yoda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And smoking shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it can never, never fails. <laughs> So, so here's a, here's something very random. I was scrolling through my Instagram feed as you do, and I saw what was really it was it was a pretty good quality rip from Rogue One of that infamous hallway scene featuring Darth Vader. And so I stopped, and I watched it, of course. Uh, and I had Harley on the couch with me, but she was entranced with her Disney Channel. But I guess something had caught her eye. Maybe she was actually out of the corner of her eye looking at my feed as I scrolled through. And she goes, oh, daddy, stop, stop, stop. And she makes me go back up once I'm finished. She goes, 
is that the Darth Vader from Rogue One that, that I would find scary? Yep. And she looks at it. She goes, I don't find that scary. <laughs> okay. She's like, well, I feel bad for those poor soldiers, but that, that's not scary. So now can I see the movie? Uh, well, I don't have... I, I sidestepped the issue by saying it's not out yet and it won't be out for a while, so... let's. Dude, she's let's, playing let's, you. Yeah, she, oh, of course she's playing me. Uh, but she did get teased at school by a couple of boys because she had not yet seen it. And I, 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 I want her to point out those two boys because... Uh, well, I, I probably shouldn't admit what I would do to them on the podcast because that's uh, probably public record, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's kind of bad for. Her. She's five years old. D- those yeah, boys, but yeah. there's something wrong with those boys' parents. Exactly. James just, James just hit the nail there. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I told Harley, I'm like, I guarantee you, Harley, that if you sat down and talked Star Wars with these two boys, you would smoke them. Hundred percent. You would a hundred percent smoke them. I mean, she she's to the to the point where she can identify people's themes in the soundtracks. Anyway, I felt bad for her. And also, like, are, are you warped that you weren't scared by that Darth Vader thing? Or is it just because it was, it was you know, like a two-inch screen that it didn't bother you so much? Yeah, it's two-inch screen. Because in theater, the first time I saw it, I was like, oh! Well, and she may not, <laughs> at five years old, be able to fully appreciate nor articulate her f- full feelings on what she saw. But it's also... Yeah, well, I, I like that she went to the level of saying, well, I feel bad for those soldiers. Yeah. But uh, yeah, she's like, otherwise, uh, whatever. I, I, don't, I didn't find that scary. It, it's such a, uh, I don't know. I, I, I found it a scary scene in the sense that, like, if you, like you said. I like found it small, scary. <laughs> on a small screen, plus the build up to that, like, there's a, the battle. And then the fact, when, like, you know, you see all these people, like, running, like, and then Brian Johnson hit, hits the button. Oh, no. Uh, Gareth Edwards. Yeah, Gareth Edwards. Sorry. No, I think you're right. I, you, I think you're right on right on the money. If she saw that on the, on our regular TV here at home with the music and everything and the build up to the scene. Yeah. yeah I think she'd have a, an, an entirely different reaction. Maybe. And maybe not. That's the other thing. Like it may not be the, the big scary climax moment that we would expect that was, that would scare kids in that movie. There's lots, there's lots going on. It's not I mean, gory Vader particularly. Us, right? right. I mean, Darth Vader yeah. has always been our boogeyman. That's what I mean. Yeah. For the, for her, it's it's you know whatever bad guys are in the Disney movies. It's uh, the bad the bear from Brave, and it's it's uh, Marshmallow from Frozen. <laughs> Those are the people that scare her. Except when he says says stuff like "Don't choke on your aspirations, Bennett." I can almost hear Bennett there. You know, <laughs> I like that line. Yeah, that's a good it, it cross. That's a good, good. crisscross there, Corey. Yeah, that was nice, eh? All right, I've got, I've got an unpopular thought here. This, this is going to ruffle some feathers. I don't know about if you it will ruffle your feathers, but somebody listening is going to want to reach through their their internet line and choke me. Uh, but you know what? I've been listening to the Rogue One soundtrack a lot, like really a lot, and I'm going to say that it's a, it's better than at least two Star Wars soundtracks and possibly three. Really, <clears throat> I, th- yep. I thought you were. I I really thought you were building us up there to say like, yeah, like I'm I'm not a fan at all. I'm I'm trying to like it and I can't. That's what I was oh, thought no. I was gonna say too. Nope, nope, nope. It's it's following a similar pattern to the Force Awakens, where at first I was underwhelmed and it grew on me. But is this uh, like is Rogue- this like when you're on a road trip and you only have like two albums, and by the end of the road trip, like you love one of those albums and you hate the other one, but it's just because that's all you had. Like if you're listening to it no, a ton, no, no, I've I've got Spotify on my phone for the car rides. I have no, no. I know you have other choice, but you said you've been like ODing on it. So like, is it just because like you just listen to so much that you think you love it more than you do? No, I, I it's because the more I listen to it, just the more I, I come to like. I'm like, man, I, I dig this track now. I really love this part. That's good. Of the soundtrack. That's yeah, good. Did no, you it's, see- it, it's really gaining ground with me. It's 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 past the Force Awakens. That is one wow. of the two that I think it's better than, hands down. Slap in the face to J Dub. I think there's yeah. I, I think it's you. If there's someone to speak to it, it's you. You you definitely spent time on all of the soundtrack. So I don't think that those comments are are uh, put out there with uh, willy nilly as no, they I, say. I, 
I, I kind of ca- caught myself off guard thinking that. I'm like, wait a sec. I like this better than The Force Awakens. And you know what else? I like this better than Attack of the Clones. Hmm. Wow. Well, there you go. Interesting. Yeah. He said and it. Have it, at him. That's Tumbling Saber on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Come at me. Come and at me. I, I also... I th- it's really close. I'm not sure if I like it better than Return of the Jedi soundtrack. Okay, now now uh, now you're ruffling feathers, Kyle. No, no, exactly. I knew I would. But you know what? Once I, I went just, to the original of all trilogy. the albums released since uh, Day for Night, World Containers my favorite. But I, of all the albums released since Day for Night, I've listened to World Container ten times more than any other. I, we went to see them in concert in Toronto, so we listened to it the whole way there and like all weekend before the show. And so I think there is something to be said for like spending a lot of time with something in your ear. Yeah, it definitely it, it, it infects you in a, in that good way. Yeah. But no, World Containers is a good one. It's very listenable right through, and I, that's one of the things with the Rogue One soundtrack. And I'm finding it very listenable all the way through. Whereas in, in, some of the stuff on Force Awakens is great, but there are lulls that, that I, I to this day I, I skip through. I don't want to hear this. My Ray meets BB-8. Boring track to me. Boring. Bye-bye. Yeah, Finn's Next. Confession by... There's a, there's four or five tracks on The Force Awakens that I'm just... Nope. Move on. And there, I mean, there's there is some gold. Ray's theme is gold. Jedi Steps, amazing. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's also some stuff in there that I'm not totally enthralled with. Fair enough. Did you... Uh, did You'd know, Kyle. You're the music guy, but... Did you catch this tweet? I've seen I've seen it going around for at least a month now, where I'm surprised it didn't get caught right away. But it was a a uh, a theme or a a rhythm or a beat from a prior Star Wars song where um, Gareth Edward or sorry the composer uh, Michael Giacchino uh, changed the tempo basically, and it sounded like a hundred percent different, but it was the same rhythm. Just changed of tempo. Did you catch that one by any chance? Well, you're talking about uh, the Imperial March. It's this. It's the Darth Vader scene that we just spoke about. It's uh, if you speed it in Rogue One, it's kind of the speed is kind of dropped in half. But if you play it at at, at two x speed, uh, it's the Imperial March. Cool. I saw something on that. I think. Are you sure on those numbers? I thought it was even like quartered. Like you have to play it at four x speed to hear the march. Yeah, that's, I thought it was four, too. Uh, whatever, whatever it is. It but does, it's cut, yeah. It, but it does sound quite different. Oh, and yeah, it's, it's, you, you have to have, I guess, a special uh, insight ear. into music and, and how music is actually written and put together to pick that up. But yeah, it's, it's undeniable. Once you speed up uh, the Rogue One soundtrack at that section, it's the Imperial March. And it's, it's one of those mind-bending things. Like, that's on the level of uh, hearing Palpatine's theme sung by children at the end of the phantom menace yeah true that was another good one but it it, like like you just said it not an easy thing to pick off and i think that can be uh, you can explain you could see that in the fact that it took this quite a while to come out like it wasn't like the movie came out and bam there it is you know like it took at least a month a month or so to, to to break yeah it took a while for sure See, Corey, we're we're now a half hour into the show, just like that, and we haven't even spoken about really any anything yet. So, there you go. You can cast your worries away. I was never worried. <laughs> I just wanted to talk about toys, man. You mean you wanted you to whisper toys. about toys? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, we'll talk about it. Trust me, I had a, I had a whole shtick, like I said. Yeah, well, you you can sit on that for now because uh, we got to talk about the for the third week in the row. The Rogue One home video release. It's been confirmed. We know that now. Uh, StarWars.com dropped a bunch of info over the week. So I thought we could take a bit of time to go over the extra content, if you will. Um, we got a bunch of, of video featurettes that I, I assume are going to be in the, that four to seven minute range that we all found so underwhelming on The Force Awakens. I really hope that the extras are better this time around. I really, really do, because... Remember how how underwhelmed we were with those extras? From The Force Awakens? Yeah. 
Of course. I mean, they they were cool, but it was like, that's it. Like, where where's my like two hours of in depth content? There's nothing. Everything well, was I like a, a short little vignette. I, our first comments were basically, oh, okay, well they're they're gonna divvy it up for several releases and just make more money like that. Those bastardos. Yeah. Well, you never know, but. So we have a bunch of vignettes, one called A Rogue Idea. It's about uh, ILM's John Knoll and how he came up with the movie concept. Of course, we all know by now this, this whole thing is his idea to begin with. Uh, a featurette on, on all the characters. Jin's got one. Cassian's got one. K2SO's got one. Uh, the package deal of Baze and Chirrut get one. Uh, Bodhi and Saw strangely get paired up for one. Uh, there's something. There's a little documentary on The Empire. Uh, Visions of Hope, The Look of Rogue One, which I'm kind of interested in to see how they put this together and, and made it look seamless with the original trilogy. Then predictably, we get uh, The Princess and The Governor, which is going to be, I guess, a, a feature probably that we've seen already. Uh, I think ABC had something on this a, a while back. I don't know if it'll be the same thing or uh, the same kind of take, but... As you can expect, something very similar to that. Just just a breakdown of how they brought Leia and, and Tarkin back via CG. Uh, epilogue. The story continues. Filmmakers and cast celebrate Rogue One's premiere and look forward into the future to Star Wars to stories yet to be told. Now, I hope they just don't stop at... Well, of course they will. They're going to stop at Episode 8 and Han Solo. Uh, but maybe there's something in there that... Uh, we don't yet know. That might be interesting. And some Rogue Connections, which is all the Easter eggs in Rogue One that we've since seen and talked about a thousand times. Anything in there is jump out at you guys or fairly standard stuff? Well, I think uh, I think we're getting our fair amount. I'm uh, I'm I'm happy with it. I'm looking I looked at the list and I was like, okay, well yeah, we want to know about K two for sure. The princess and the governor, definitely. Yeah, that was the one for me too, the princess and the governor. But like like Corey said, I didn't look at this one like with the last release and go, ah, oh, this doesn't seem like anything. Like there seems like there is some content on it. We'll see. You never know. It could just be a lot of titles. Um, but yeah, it sounds like there's going to be a reasonable amount of, of content for the people who really want the, the extra stuff. I sure hope the, so. The, the one thing I say that is kind of missing, I think it's kind of missing, like you don't see anything about uh, deleted scenes, which I've heard people on Twitter kind of complaining about a bit. Fine. But also, I would like to have heard, like, personally, I would like to have heard a little more about the reshoots. Because, uh, again, you could have all these deleted scenes from footage that wasn't used or never used, you know? like, And you can kind of explain what they did different, why they did it differently, which I think would be very interesting. But who knows? Maybe we want to keep some things closer to the heart, right? Yeah, I think some of that stuff will eventually come out. I, th I think the making of Rogue One book comes out in the fall. I want to say the fall. Um, but yes, yeah, so I, I imagine some of that stuff will, will never come out. I think some of it's sort of uh, a dirty little secret that they don't want to talk about the reasons why. Because, i.e., it wasn't very good. I mean, they can, they can pretty it up, put lipstick on the pig, I'm sure. I'm sure Lucasfilm and Disney do that as well. Or better than anybody, but uh, I, I think the first place to look for that will be the making of Rogue One. Uh, and of course, as usual, we get some retailer exclusives. Tar uh, Target, which we no, no longer have access to, has a five-disc exclusive set. Uh, Best Buy's got a Steelbook version and the Walmart exclusive. All this on top of the regular edition. Um, What's that supposed to mean, Steelbook? I don't know. It's I think that's I don't know if it's a Best Buy exclusive thing, but the boxes is metal and uh it just it just looks really nice but uh guys i i i don't know if you guys are picking up this film but if you do is it just the standard release good enough for you guys are you going to go after one of these exclusives oh uh, i'd like to get the k2so one yeah, yeah. If, I, if i bought it myself i'd probably buy the k2so one but it it will more likely be gifted to me and then i'll get the probably the basic one which is good enough, right? You oh yeah, absolutely. Movie and that's it, for sure. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna chase down the K2SO. I've got the BB-8 Walmart exclusive, and it'll be nice to have the the K2 to go along with it. I wonder if that'll be the move now. 
for every Star Wars movie, Walmart will have a droid focused uh, exclusive. No, I think it would be more character focused because like BB-8 was a new character that was introduced, K2 as well. Who knows? Who, I don't think they're going to introduce a new droid that's going to be like a sensation every film. But maybe a new character. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Anyway, this is coming up. It's about, a, what, five weeks away till we get this? I, I really wish I had gotten that fourth viewing in. I gotta wait another five weeks until I can watch it again. Ugh. Ugly. But, such is life. There are worse things in this world, right? Yeah, you could have uh, lost at curling. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing you're not bitter, James. Uh, you know what? It was sort of my fault. Like, if if there Ooh. was someone to lay it on, it was probably me. I didn't play very oh. well. Oh, burn. Yeah. Man. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was off my game. Ah, what are you going to do? Well, which position do you have? I'm the lead, so, like, I, I sweep a lot. Am I still, in in theory, it's, like, the least important position, which is good. So if someone's going to be off their game, I guess it's good it was me. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, still. Ah, what are you going to do? Mm, go back at it next year. Go back at it, go back at it next year, and in the meantime, you get to think ahead to softball season coming in the next couple months. Oh yeah, that's on us. Uh, anyway, guys, so again, not much news this week, but Han Solo has officially started shooting again. Because remember, back in episode sixty or sixty-one, I think we talked about the Instagram shot that Chris Miller had put up on his page, the clapboard with uh, Star Wars red cup on it. And we figured, oh, there he goes. They've started shooting the Han Solo film. Uh, but for whatever reason, uh, this past week, Han, uh, StarWars.com came out and declared that principal photography has started shooting. So I don't know, maybe those those early shots were, I don't know. Just, I have actually no, no clue. <laughs> Why would they be doing that weeks ago? Uh, only to confirm it now. But uh, What if they were shooting trailer footage, which they seem to do now? And now they're shooting principal photography. Or they well, were doing something that didn't involve the cast. Yeah, maybe they're shooting like, you know, background plates or something like that for, for effects later. Who knows? Could have been just capturing scenery or something like that. Um, but James, you make a good point. People were complaining about uh, not having deleted scenes for Rogue One. Just go watch a trailer. Yeah, there's all your deleted scenes. <laughs> there they go. <laughs> There's the cutting room floor in, in two and a half minutes. Uh, but look at that, that, that look at that cast picture. And crew, I guess, if you have uh, Miller and Lord there. Yeah, it looks like an episode of Friends. Yeah. Bite your tongue. I saw the caption on Twitter this weekend. It stuck with me. Like, they Ugh. had the, the Friends insignia at the bottom. Ugh. Get out of here. I mean, I, you're not Kyle wrong. Kyle doesn't like it. Ugh. Ugh. I feel the same way about Friends as as Rob over at Gen X Wing feels about Seinfeld. Oh, I love Friends. Me too. Yeah, I, I I liked it during its run, but now I can't watch it. Oh yeah, Ross just gets he just grates on me like like. Uh, well, Ross has always always got to me. Like even back then, I was like, "Oh come on, Rachel, you could do so much better." <laughs> You're jealous. That's not the same thing. <laughs> no, but I was, was like, he was such a sad sack. Like. Yeah, I never, I never really loved them either. You're right. I'm Ross. <laughs> any shock that in this this awesome cast picture from the cockpit of the Falcon? Any is it any surprise that Woody looks like the one that's having the most fun? Yeah, it looks Dad, like he's high, he's high as hell. It looks like he's high. That's what I was gonna say. He looks high. <laughs> Sorry, Woody Harrelson. We know you're not high. Disclaimer. High on spice, yeah. as it were, in the Star Wars universe. So he's had some death sticks. Life. Pretty funny though, right? Like uh, a week ago, this uh, Fleabag's uh, Phoebe Waller Bridge, I think her name is. She was saying, "No, no, no, I don't know what you're talking about. What's uh, Han Solo? What? I don't. I haven't spoken anything anybody about that." Oops, there she is. How did you get in there? Liar! She's uh, the one doing the motion capture, right? Yeah, people are saying that maybe she's going to be a female droid, which I, I don't get. Like, just just slap some. Uh, a medal on her like Anthony Anthony Daniels and let her be a droid. I gotta say, there's something about uh, Aaron Reich's face in this picture that makes him look 
quite Harrison Ford esque. You find it? it yes, yeah, the smile. Yeah, the grin. Yeah, but I mean, he's, he looks short though. Even sitting down, he looks short. Yeah, I mean, Harrison Ford is maybe six six one, I think, in, in his prime shooting these movies. I I have no clue how tall. Alden Ehrenreich is, but yeah, I mean, they have, they have ways to shoot to make things. I mean, if they can make Tom Cruise, I was gonna go to Tom Cruise. I guess he's the benchmark for this, eh? Yeah, he's he's the benchmark for for trickery like that. <laughs> Wesley Snipes. I mean, so many of these guys, so many of these guys are just tiny, tiny people, and they they're made <laughs> to look so big in in real life. They're just not. Um, yeah, I mean, great looking cast, but I'm looking at Amelia Clark. And not that her hair really gives it away, but Corey, do you think that she might be playing Arinda Price from, or Governor Price from Rebels? Do you think she might be one of the villains in this movie? Hmm. The hairdo is not quite the same. Nor is it the same color. But, you know, she's a British actress. The hair is plausible. It's plausible that they could be giving her a Price haircut. I don't know. I'm it's a reach. It's a reach. I know. I'm. I'm. I went right away. Low hanging fruit, like obviously either associated with Han or Woody's character. Hey, maybe she's Woody's daughter, and Han tries to date her, and that causes the falling out. Huh. <laughs> well, I, I think it suffices to say that. No matter what we we look at this one, like Han is definitely going to be in some kind of uh, bad breakup or bad relate. It's not going to end well for him in a relationship, and I'm pretty sure that he will be having some kind of love interest in this movie. Well, of course, it's of course it is. Han has to have a love interest. Well, it's definitely not the droid. Uh-huh. Oh wow. Maybe that's maybe maybe it is, and that's why he doesn't like seem to like droids at all. Come a new hope. <laughs> <laughs> Get because of permanent resident well. goldenrod. <laughs> that's one of my favorite lines in Star Wars. Yeah, maybe there was a a, a bad breakup, a, a bad sex spot thing with Han. You never know. It's like, you know, I I what is I took my shirt off and the the head started exploding. <laughs> Uh, and so, so there's Chewie in the picture looming over everybody, a giant seven footer. Uh, so Eunice Suatomo this week, um, in, in a v- very Jimmy V style announcement made it be known, or at least gave the strong indication. I, I don't think Lucasfilm or his, his representative firm followed up with any type of confirmation, but it seems like Eunice Suatomo, the Finnish basketball player and now actor, is in as Chewie for the long term. And I, I wonder if that's if that spells the end of Peter Mayhew's participation in these. I, I I have to imagine they'd probably keep him around as some sort of consultant, but it seemed very much uh from the tone of of his uh letter that he wrote, sent to, out to fans, Suatomo that is, that um he's it. He's the guy. Yeah, it seemed like a passing of the torch kind of deal. And we can't complain. I mean, Chewie from The Force Awakens and his action sequences was as upbeat and, and functional <laughs> as he's ever been. So, um, no, I mean, Peter, Peter Mayhew, like, love the guy. He looks like such a gentle giant, but uh, and I literally... I, well, from personal experience, I can say that he is. He was an absolute joy to have met. I'm so glad that I got to meet that guy. You know, after after all was said and done last night with the uh, with rebels in the hockey game, I put on some Clone Wars, and it was the last episode of season three. And lo and behold, Chewbacca made a a cameo, and it was awesome, man. And then I watched the documentary behind it after, and he was uh, Peter Mayhew was like right up in there, like when they were doing this episode, like how are we can do this properly, right? And they had him as episode with in in the forest. Yeah, with Ahsoka and the Trandoshans hunting. Right, great arc. Yeah, that was a cool arc. Yeah, really fun. 
And they did him so well too. So you're saying Peter Mayhew was involved with that? Yeah, he was like a like you said a consultant kind of. Huh, interesting that they would bring him in for an animated show like that. Yeah, very cool. Uh, so a, c- a couple of the takeaways here uh, with regards to this release. So it's still untitled, the movie. And so I guess we can take bets as to whether or not they will reveal the title at, at Celebration coming up or at D23 in July. Anybody want to take a bet? Well, I, first and foremost, do you think there's actually even going to be a title to this movie? Yeah, I don't think they're going to name it Han Solo. You can't think it's going to be a Han Solo story? I don't think so. Han's Solo? That'd be cool. I, you know, no. personally, <laughs> I I haven't even I haven't even thought about that yet. Like, I thought it was just uh, the Han Solo movie or the Han Solo story, you know? No, I think, I think we're due for an, an actual title. Hmm. I, I think it's all just a matter of whether or not uh, it's going to happen at Celebration or D23. Yeah, I think it's a little Celebration would be a little too soon, seeing as how we just got The Last Jedi not even a month ago. Yeah, just... I mean, I figure at Celebration you probably get one big announcement per medium. You know what I mean? Like, so uh, in movies, we'll probably get one bombshell for uh, The Last Jedi. We'll probably get some kind of bombshell for uh, the 40th anniversary of A New Hope. And no, I don't mean the release of the of the old, unre- unedited, unaltered versions. Um, there'll probably be a big reveal as, as in terms of books or comics. There'll probably be a big reveal in terms of the animated stuff. So I, I think each one gets slotted with a big reveal. So yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe D23 is when they they give us some sort of title. That would make more sense to me anyhow. And the other thing is that it's, it, they've, now, they've officially put it, put it to paper now. May 25th, 2018 is the slated release date for the Han Solo flick. So are, are they giving up this December time that they've owned for the last couple of years and, and presumably will again this year? Or is this, are they running away from Avatar, which Avatar 2, which I think is supposed to come out in December of this year or of, of 2018? I don't. I don't know what's going on here. I think but now the number two. The number two is is key. It's either because they're going to put out two Star Wars movies, and they're 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 testing the waters for both markets just to make sure they're both going to work, and their their plan's going to be like Christmas, spring, Christmas, spring, or it's Avatar two. One of those two things. Those are my two guesses. I I think it's a it's a matter of both. Like like James said, moving it to spring, then you can have your your trilogy as well, and then keep it that way, like spring, Christmas, spring, Christmas. As soon as one comes out of theater, another one's coming in basically for that time period. But yeah, Avatar, I think, in my personal opinion, I've been saying it a long time, like it's got to have something to do with it. You don't want two movies like that in the theater at the same time, especially around Christmas. Like it's just you're saturating the market with sci-fi. Like I don't even think it'd be good for the business at all. You know, like keep, you got to keep them separated. <laughs> I'm sure it'd be great for the business. I, I think there's nothing that Cineplex would like more than to have those two movies out through the holidays. Uh, yeah. I, if anything, they'd probably want them want there to be just a bit more breathing room between the two, so that they don't cannibalize a bit of business. No, you wouldn't want the same launch night. That's true. But if one came out December 9th and the other came out the 26th, boom. Man, they're in that, they're in heaven. That that's enough leadway. Like it gives a film enough time to get a foothold. A couple a week, a month, three weeks, whatever. Yeah. So I, Avatar two is scheduled to release the twenty first of December. So even if if Han Solo took its usual December slot, which would put it, I don't know, on a December fourteenth or fifteenth release. It's a week. That's yeah. That's that's not even a week. And then yeah, it, it, you would assume that Avatar 2 would come in and just bounce, either bounce it right out of the number one slot or take a bunch of its business away. Yeah, big time. Like, there, there's no way that Disney's going to do that. Like, so, I would... mean, they, they could be backing up to May just... Uh, uh, and now, well, now look what they're doing. They they go and they put it in May and, and... I don't know if they're putting in direct competition with, but it they're putting three three weeks room between it and Avengers Infinity War. That's true. Yeah, yeah but that's, that's them and them versus them. 
But again, you're, you're cannibalizing yourself in a way, though. Like, you, you're not giving these movies ample breathing room. Who knows? Maybe, maybe uh, <clears throat> Infinity War will get pushed to a July slot. That'd be good for the uh, usually Independence Day weekends, a big one. That would be a good weekend for Infinity War. It would. You're right. And I mean, there's three weeks between movies, uh, Avengers and Han Solo. So is maybe that's enough for for Avengers to kind of lose its initial steam. I would imagine that when these guys forecast this stuff, as much as they the the number crunchers want them to be conservative, the people making the plans probably still air on the like still probably you know hope for the best so when they're they, the people would have to be saying like no we need at least a month like even if three weeks is is probably enough room in between like i can't imagine them leaving that little breathing space thinking that both movies are going to be huge you know what i mean yeah anyway i i still think there's a very good chance a very good chance that avatar 2 gets bumped i mean this is james cameron he's notorious for for bumping this project down the road, so I I, I would still I would I, I think it would be a good value bet to put a few bucks down that Star Wars that Han Solo does get moved to this, the end of 2018. Anyway, uh, guys, that's the end of the news for this week. My God, Corey, you were right. We've got nothing to talk about. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I'm I'm still super excited for Han Solo. The the more every time they release something, I'm more excited about it. Agreed. I I agree. And you know, so quickly, like I just want to say, I I've I've been seeing some feedback, like some backlash on, like again, to each their own. But yeah, a lot of people like, eh, can't believe they're doing this. And I'm like, really? Yeah, but Corey, you got to understand, you love everything, and and you've basically said there's nothing they can do that I won't like. But some people, no, there, there's, there's definitely a lot of stuff they could do that I won't like. Will they do that? I don't know. Like I, I, I have. You don't think so? I'm trusting them right now. I think they're on their game. But what I was gonna get at is they've, they've, they basically picked arguably the single most beloved character in, in from the OT anyway, and they're making a movie about him. And so of course you're gonna like have divided the fandom when you do that. Of course there's gonna be some people who go like, no, leave it alone. It shouldn't. It's like Goonies, man. Basically, this is for some people they're redoing Goonies. Yeah, for some not, people feel really... like you you don't need to demystify Han Solo. It, it was cool to have his background murky and and, and leave it to your mind's eye. To, and to, you'll to, never to... you'll never recapture his char- part of what his charm was the era he was generated in that like late seventies swag. The like you just won't be able to recreate that, so you can't make him cool retro cool like he was. Yeah, I saw a lot of people hating on uh, Mr. Aaron Reich and. Just saying, like, he looks nothing like him. This is such, like, this is, like, sacrilege. I'm like, okay, relax, man. Like, this could be a fun movie. Hey, in the history of the world, after someone has been told to relax, no one has ever relaxed. Yeah, that just oh, makes trust it worse, me. right? <laughs> Dude, trust me. I have a wife. <laughs> you <know>. do? <laughs> trust James, me. James, James, Corey has a wife. I know. What, what's what, that you, about? We can make her appear if we talk about toys loudly. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> But but you you know, yeah that doesn't go over too well. Hey everybody, Facebook message Corey and ask to see the pictures of his toys. <laughs> his new toys. <laughs> kind of like you know, no, don't do that, please. <laughs> if if you care. want Corey to be part of this show, don't don't send that don't send that message. But I'm almost like ashamed now. The the more and more I'm on Twitter, and even within the Commonwealth, like uh, the guys over at the Nerd Room and. Like I'm looking at their collections and I'm like, wow, like my, mine's so lame <laughs> compared to theirs. <laughs> but there's a reason for that. We'll get into that on Sith Disturbers, I think. Like Qui Gon says, there's always a bigger fish. Yeah. Oh, uh, so where do we go from here? Is it time to talk rebels, Corey? We could do that. I guess we could do that. Cool. I could use a T. All right, so we're going to talk about Rebels. James is going to go grab a grab a nice cuppa. And uh, James, we'll, we'll ping you when it's time to come back. Ping! Cool, guys. Have fun. All right, Corey. So here we are. We're plowing ahead here with the Rebels season. Number three is, is it's getting close to the end, man. We've only got, like, what, four episodes left? Yeah. Man. And a lot has flying. to happen. Like, 
A and lot has the, to happen. The crazy part about that is, too, we still have that episode with the the droids to look forward to, which, uh, I don't know, we got Obi-Wan, we got the, the whole Thrawn thing. There's, there's a Sabine's lot to happen missing. in, what, I guess, five episodes worth of stuff, considering the, the finale is, is a double length. Yeah, it's nuts. There's a lot going on. Anyway, we're, we're going to get to that over time, but let's talk about Through Imperial Eyes. And I, w- I will just say that this this episode had me right from the early previews that uh, StarWars.com released over the course of the week. And many people were wondering, my, myself included, I assume you're among them, uh, would this episode be the curtain call for Callus? Was he going to get exposed and killed in his in this episode? I didn't think so, but only slightly. Like it was like a fifty one forty nine type thing on the. Uh, no, this is not his last episode. They really had me going there. What, uh, what, what was your thoughts? Well, I was kind of on the same page as you. Like I, I couldn't say that I, I knew or didn't know. I think I can look back and say that I had an inkling that he was going to continue to live for now, anyhow. But, yeah, having watching the episode for the first time was really exciting. Like, watching it a second and third time again today, uh, great episode, but the first watch was a real natal biter, like edge of the seat kind of stuff. Like, you just, you didn't know what was going to happen, right? There was so much happening at the same time. Uh, the episode was coming to an end so quickly, and you're like, nothing is resolved. Oh my god! So yeah, it was definitely exciting. A lot of very suspenseful. And, and I mean, right from the opening minute, they get you immersed right away with with Callus's blinking eyes opening up. Yeah, the and POV see, was awesome. Yeah, his, you see his POV, and again, this Empire, they're they're weird, man. Why would they put a sink in the guy's quarters but no little toilet? You know, the plumbing's there. Just give the guy a toilet. It's true too. And he woke up in uniform, which is kind of odd too. <laughs> but the like first, at, at least crack off the armor there, Callus. The first thing I look for in that room, though, when you see the uh, this like just him waking up, whatever it is, and groggy and hearing the alarm, I was really looking for that uh, that piece of meteor that Zeb had given him. You think he kept but it as like a trinket? He did in the episode. He puts it up on his shelf, but. Anyhow, I I didn't manage to see it in this episode. Anyhow, uh, maybe Thrawn is saving that for the eventual exposure. It's possible. I mean this this was a really this I have to say this is probably one of my favorite episodes of, of the entire series. Well, yeah, I'll definitely give it a. I don't know if I want to go as far to say top five, but definitely no doubt top ten. Yeah, I mean I I I don't know if I rate them that way but this one was definitely notable so um i mean without going beat by beat through the episode it it definitely starts with the empire trying to get the drop on the rebels they they've captured a shuttle which is being piloted by Ezra and uh, he's on he's on a little covert mission to spring Callus free because you know, it's it's time i guess in their minds to get Callus out of there before he's exposed and killed and well, they, um, they know at that point that uh, the Empire knows something about a Fulcrum agent. They do know. They, they, they know that the Empire has been tracking Fulcrum transmissions. But it's funny that Callus doesn't know that. The Rebels know, but Callus doesn't know. That's true. Well, it's probably, it could be Thrawn operating, you know, solo style. Doing his thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Ezra is taken, taken captive again. Here we go. <laughs> Although wow. I, I guess I'll let them off the hook. It was, it was on purpose this time. Uh, but here we go with, with another member of the rebels team being, being taken captive. I liked his, his gear too, but just like those, those air vents or whatever you want to call them. Those tubes. They well, always did, add so much to that, the that outfit. We, I mean, I think we talked about this last week, even when we were talking about, uh, Macquarie stuff. I'm pretty sure that's the Macquarie concept for for Luke Skywalker. I mean, uh, that outfit, I mean, not so much the helmet, but definitely the rest of his getup was was very Macquarie inspired. I think. No, you're right. Like uh, we had brought it up that that one 
image where he's battling Vader with the scuba mask or whatever. He's got those two tubes kind of running down the back of his back. Yeah, and the, it was what, like a dark blue and a rust color? Yeah. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I, I think I think that's another Macquarie concept that was pulled. And we were waiting for that one. I think we specifically talked about that one. I mean, he had no idea it would be used a week later. Uh, so so we've got uh, AP5 Chopper decked up as a as an Imperial droid once again. And uh, they're aboard an Imperial cruiser. And they're trying to just steal enough information, more information again. Uh, codes, I think, they were after, right? And uh, anyway, well, we're they were trying to get, they were trying to get codes to Kanan and and Rex, excuse me. Right, Kanan and Rex. They wanted to get them codes so they can get so they could land, right, and then get get them out of there. Yeah, the plan had changed once Ezra got uh, shipped over to Thrones Star Destroyer. Yeah, a little curveball there. We we get another heavy dose of Thrawn, and. I gotta say, I, I, I'm less and less impressed with Thrawn the more we go here. Interesting, because I, I can almost quote you as saying is, I ran a poll at the beginning of the season asking if Thrawn would ever get physical. And this episode did indeed answer that question, but a lot of folks were on the same accord as you, Kyle. I remember you strongly being on the page of saying, you know, no, he's just too smart. He's not going to get, uh, no one's going to put uh, him in a corner, kind of, you know what I mean? Right. Like, and I mean, he's I, just going to be two I steps assume, ahead yeah, of the game. We, right. I mean, we see him training with those assassin droids, those huge droids that took out Zeb, no problem. Uh, Thrawn's going fist to fist with two of them and beating the turret of both. And so what what bothers me is that they've basically made him like a Mary Sue. He's perfectly smart. He's perfectly trained. The, this guy, there's no flaw to this guy. And it's driving me a little bit cuckoo now. Oh, trust me. I think his flaw, once discovered, is going to be his downfall. I, I think this guy does have a, th- a flaw. He's too thorough. He, he, <clears throat> he's too, I don't want to say callous, but he's too involved in himself he's too overconfident and i think that's going to be his downfall but that's also the emperor's downfall your overconfidence is your weakness i mean we're gonna we're gonna do that again why not it could be a recurring theme <laughs> like okay i guess I'm, I'm i'm bored with his monotony his monotonous voice is driving me a bit cuckoo as well dude and I know you're cool and collected and you're always thinking and everything is on the even keel. But can you be any more boring? I think that's part of his character, you know? Like, we've we've seen him lose it once on that guy. Uh, the episode with the Calicory. Yeah. Where he kind of just grabs the guy and he's like, but then he regains his composure. And I think that's part of being a good bad guy. It's just remaining composed and not uh, lashing out, you know, and getting angry. Because once that happens, you kind of start losing your cool, you're not thinking clearly. Yeah, well, you know what? We we saw the the clips in the trailer way back when of, of Thrawn getting physical. But now we've seen this those clips. We've seen Thrawn get physical. So if he does it again, it's going to be a, a footage that we have not seen. So I, I wonder, is, is he going to... Is this leading to an eventual... Throwdown between Callus and Thrawn because don't forget Callus is Callus can can throw down as well. Oh yeah, you think to those two down. are going to go at it? Either one way or another, yes, I do. Not necessarily hand to hand, but uh, I think this season's climax is heavily going to involve the two of them. Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously these their story's not done, uh, but we know that in a in a battle of wits. <laughs> Based on this week's results, Callus stands no chance because he he threw his best pitch at Callus uh, at Thrawn, and Thrawn saw right through it. Yeah, he really did. He he definitely he had the upper hand at the end of the episode. Even too, I thought you know he's gonna get away with it. Like he he did pull this off, but no, they still right away. Ularin and Thrawn were like, yeah. What, what, what was the guy's name? 
Lieutenant List. Yeah, Lieutenant List is he's just not the kind of guy that can pull something like this off. Like they knew. Yeah, he's they, without saying it, they're saying he's too much of an idiot. He can't he's not smart enough to do this. Which is true. I mean, List has been kind of a, a bumbler since the beginning. But the well, way Callus since did that episode too, that he referenced, right? Where he referenced his run in with Leia in a princess on Lothal. Yeah. And he was a total dope in that episode. He knew it. And so Thrawn and Ularen probably know as well that no, this guy's not capable of, of this type of trickery. So they, they see right through it. They know it's Callus. They reveal it, reveal that at the end. And uh, we, we know now. It's just a matter of time before, uh, I guess, the axe drops for Callus permanently. Yeah, he, uh, and Thrawn he, basically says straight up, uh, I think, what, do you, what does he say? He's, uh, uh, I believe Fulcrum, Fulcrum is going to be, yeah, Fulcrum more will be more than... useful to us than Callus ever was. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, he's going to, obviously, I mean, everybody's suspicions were correct. He's going to use Fulcrum to lead the Empire straight to the Rebels. So all that work that, that Thrawn has put in, narrowing down all the planets from thousands down to 90, and now what seems, what, maybe 10, 12 planets? Well, I was thinking more like 20, 30, but... Oh, whatever it is, there's not many left. He's down to a, a relative handful of planets that the Rebels could be on. And so the, the net was closing. But he didn't have to do any of that work because Callus was going to do it for him anyway. Yeah, it looks as if... Uh, that's what I wanted to ask you, kind of. Like, I hope his whole having erased that planet and moved it and chosen a different planet... Let's hope. Uh, let's hope first of all he doesn't have an eidetic memory. Well, that th that will be the last straw for me, because I I noticed that they he didn't point that out, and we don't like he saw he was staring at the map. Yeah, he he they definitely made a point of making like him stare at that for quite a while. And you're you're right. If you if if they turn around and reveal that yes, I know that you switched a planet out of my recording in, a, in an attempt to to trip me up. If he's photographically memorized all the planets on his on his little 3D map, that's it for me. Like he's perfectly calculating, he's perfectly trained, and he has a photographic memory. No, you you've jumped the shark. Hey, who knows, man? The galaxy's a really, really, really big place. There could be some real special folk there. Ah, if, well, not only it's, that, it's, it's just a matter of time that he over, overtakes the the emperor then, because well, he's he, he's he, just he, as smart. But he knows at the same time that someone's been fooling around in his office. Like, I'm sure, like, with these, you know, we can figure this stuff out in our day and age. If someone's tampered with something, you can kind of backtrack those steps, right? Well, and, and that'll, well that'll be fine. If they have a scene with, with Thrawn saying, you know, like, restore backup from this time yesterday. Oh, good. There, see, there is a difference between yesterday's map and today's. They jerked around with it. But if he just says, ah, uh, you know what? I remember. I remember you guys switched a plan on me, and I know that because I'm smart. No, then, I don't think they'll go that route. If they do explain it, I just, like I said, I just hope in the long run, Folk, uh, or Callus didn't, you know, point out that planet to him directly, which I think well, is going to be the case. That may be, the, well, then they may as well kill Callus now because he's already led them right there. Yeah, but there's more for him to, I think he's going to have his moment in the sun. I mean, what they should, I mean, if they had more time, but what they should have done is asked Chopper to switch all the planets. Just just move a bunch of them around. Yeah, but then he would have known 100% that something was done. But Yeah, but then he would still know it's still one of those 30 or however many planets you think he's got left. It's it's still the same 30 planets, but which one? But now he's he switched one of those 30. Yeah, definitely a, definitely a risk. <laughs> Well, you you mentioned his name before. We're finally reintroduced to Admiral or Colonel Yularen from Clone War fame. Nice to see him again. It was it was actually oddly comforting to hear his voice again. Yeah, I like they use the same voice actor and like again watching the Clone Wars now. I'm so into it. Uh, he's cool in it, you know. Like even in this, he's not so much like. Uh, like he he's internal affairs, if you will, you know, like an investigator, like he's a by the book kind of guy. Yeah, I mean, Yularen's a good guy. <laughs> I wonder if that's why they gave him that switch, because even in the Clone Wars, he, he never had that 
mean spiritedness that an imperial typically has. Like he's always been just a good guy, and he now likes, they've just made him order. sort of uh, internal affairs, like you said. So they get he gets to maintain that that good guy image of of just being like an internal cop. He's not out there killing innocent people or uh, oppressing freedoms. He's just keeping everybody, keeping his own imperial people on the level. Yeah, super smart. Um, but yeah, I, I thought that was really nice. I mean, you know, we, we were this close to a, a Rex Yularen reunion too. Imagine how that would have went down if, if uh, who knows if Yularen would have recognized him. I highly doubt it. No, you never know. If you would have told him his name, like, hey, it's me, Rex, but, like... Well, Yularen would have recognized a clone. Definitely. And it would, I don't think it would have taken him very long to figure out, you know, why is there a clone still running around out there? Like, who is that one? I don't, I don't think it would have taken him long to figure out that it's Rex. What do you think ever happened to Gregor and Wolf? I like to think they're still fishing for those giant beasts on uh, whichever planet they were on when when we first met up with them. I hope so. I uh, yeah, I hope so too. Those are, those are good dudes, good people. Um what else about this episode? I feel like we're we're cutting it short here. It was it was it was really a lot going on. This was a very tension-filled episode, more so than I think any other episode short of a finale. Well, I think they, again, the Rebels kind of underestimated Thrawn. Again, they didn't know he was going to be there, but uh, Sabine's got to kind of cool it with her artwork. Like, Thrawn, <laughs> I loved I loved the way he, right off the bat, he's just like, the way he deduced everything was really nice. Like, it was logical. It was a conclusion that can be made. Yeah, well, I thought there was some some jumping there too. Well, this is look at the lines, look at the this the the colors used. This is the artwork of Sabine Wren, and well, then that must mean this helmet was worn by Jedi apprentice Ezra Bridger. What? Okay, fine. You know everything. That's how they broke into my office. Yeah, and that's he, he tricked his way into my office and blah blah blah. Anyway, because that guard, that guard was his failsafe, you know. And that guy was pretty strict. Remember, like they made a point of doing that at the beginning, like when um, Lieutenant, what's his name again? List, List. Yeah, he's like, oh, I'm Lieutenant List. Let me in. Blah blah blah. And the guy's like, Yeah, just give me your data card or whatever, you know. Yeah, there's there's no exceptions. Uh, anyway, you have anything else you want to say about this episode? Very good episode. Like, whew, different kind of genre in a way. Like, nail biter, suspenseful, uh, mystery, like spy. had had a lot to offer. I, it definitely did. I, I was very very pleased with that episode. But one that you really have to pay attention to. It's not one that you can just have you know watch once and move on like there there was a lot of nuance going on in the episode yeah like my my son he's my son's going to be 5 in a couple of weeks and i could tell like he wanted to watch it and he watched about half of it and then it was just too like heavy for him kind of he was kind of just like not so much into it you know yeah, it's this would be a, yeah. My daughter fell asleep like, on the couch watching it. There's, she like, had I, no interest. Like I'm trying to explain to him like uh, treachery and being a traitor and uh, like the mutiny and how he's defecting and helping the rebels. And he was like looking at me like, hmm? he's a bad guy still, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, no. Uh, all right. Well, um, I mean, you still think that uh, Callus makes it out of this alive, or is he he's a goner? Uh, to be honest, like the more I see his character, I see how valuable he could be to the uh, the rebellion. I would like to see him live into a season four and have a part of the rebellion, and you know, make a difference. But I would think uh, chances sixty five thirty five that he meets his end, uh, saving the rebellion, if you will, in this season. 
I, I think, think it, I think I'm more on the eighty twenty that he's done. But do you see himself like when he goes, it's it's gonna be like like an, a, uh, a sacrificial atonement for leading the the empire to the rebels. Yeah, like he he's gonna mess stuff up, and it's gonna be a big thing, and he, he might die. I don't I don't know if Thrawn's gonna die because he's a bankable character. And another thing I think that is also going to come into play, which we'll talk about in another episode, is Sabine's a wild card at this point. We don't know the time that's going to pass between these episodes, but hopefully she can... You know, she she knows what the Rebellion's going through right now, and she knows that they need her. So hopefully she can round stuff up at, on her end, uh, get her stuff in order, and, you know... Mandalore is a wild card. Certainly. And I hope but, that I mean, plays into if, things. If, if Mandalore, to one episode, I think the finale, like this, this, the last part, is describes Ezra marshalling some help from an unexpected source. Now, we could, we could assume that maybe Sabine and the Mandalorians are that unexpected source, considering we think that they're, we're supposed to believe that they're gone, right? That Sabine is off the board as as a player for now? More or less, until she gets like her stuff together, like her family stuff and maybe so even so could much Sab- far as her planets. Yeah, so could Sabine bring the Mandalorians in as, as help, reinforcements against the Empire? I think that's the most likely answer. The the only other options I would think are unlikely, Obi Wan, which is probably really not gonna happen. Uh Maul. No, that's yeah, that's not gonna happen. That's not going to happen. Who knows? Hondo and the pirates. That would be that. Uh, that would be something. Not considered yet. Hondo and the and yeah, maybe some help with the pirates. Um, Mart Matten. What, what did those mm-hmm. kids call themselves? Iron Squadron. Yeah, maybe Iron Squadron is is going to come in and help. Well, aren't they already with the rebellion? Did they go back, or did they stay with uh, Uncle Uncle Sato? I think they stayed with him. I can't say one hundred percent for sure, but or maybe no, they were probably too proud to be like, "No, our place is here." You know, one th- one thing eventuality I can see for Callus is that you know the rebels are getting it handed to them on their base on Adalon, and and Callus just turns the tide and allows the rebels to escape by you know destroying his own ship. You know, crashing one Star Destroyer into another, uh, maybe trying to take out Thrawn himself and paying the price. It's but, definitely got to be something unexpected for the viewer and Thrawn. Like, I really want to see him get to one up on Thrawn. Because Thrawn's obviously, now that he knows it's him, it's going to be very interesting. Like, he's obviously going to set him up to get information, which Callus is most likely obviously going to fall for. So, who knows? You had a theory a couple of weeks back that, you know, when the droids get captured, maybe they, maybe Thrawn there is able to see, hey, you played around on my computer. Let's see what you did. Maybe gets the information about, uh, is it Onderon that they're on? Is it, no. Adelon. Adelon, sorry. Yeah, no, I see what you're saying. All right. Well, um, hey, look, <laughs> Callus is no doubt in a bad situation here. So, uh, we'll find out. I'm, I'm, They've they've humanized this guy now, right? Yeah, big time. Which mm. is really odd. Yeah, it's it's if weird you, to be if you pulling could love for this, this guy. guy yeah, it said if you could love this guy, Kyle, you could love Kylo Ren. No, come on. What what has Callus know. really done that we've seen? We we've heard him say that he gave the order to exterminate the Lasats. Uh, the Lasats. That's awful, but until you see it, it's it's hard to really Buy in. It still happened, man. Yeah, it still happened, but now we're we're definitely rooting for this guy now. And it looks like it's gonna for me. It's gonna end badly. I think he he blew his chance. He had the chance to escape with, uh, Kanan, Ezra, and Rex aboard that craft, and he passed it up and said, "I can do I can do more good here." No, you can't. Well, you know what the thing about that is too is that I think. What he did in this episode, he did, if it were a test, he scored 110%. So in his That's mind, impossible. Either way. 
he <laughs> loopholed this thing, man. He he just play it, everything played out so well in his favor to the point where even uh Ularen was watching them escape and uh Ezra addressed this uh list all that stuff it, it, it all played all into his favor like everything just looked perfect but yeah to the powers of uh the process of deduction Thrawn kind of just said no no and and, that, and that's that's kind of what bothers me with the whole thing like he Done. I figured it out. Okay. I know you, well, even, it's a 22 you, minute show on, and you got to move it quickly. I get it, but... Yularen was on the same page as him right off the bat. Like He's like, everything... Yularen's the one who points out everything fell into place too well, like too easily. And Thrawn's like, you're right. Uh, he did, but Yularen I don't think would be able to put it all together. At least not as not half as quickly as Thrawn. Because Yularen was stunned. That it was callous. Like it, it seemed like he was in complete disbelief that that callous was fulcrum. But anyway, let's not let's not ramble too much. We've we've done a half hour rebel recap here. Rebel rebel. What we want? We don't, we should probably segment this part of the show. We don't have a name for it. The rebels rundown. Is that taken? Anybody else doing rebels rundown? A tentative name. Rebels rundown. We'll stick with that Bridger for now. Ter- I say Bridger transmissions. I'm pretty sure that's being done. <clears throat> Rebels run down for now. Anyway, maybe maybe we'll put it to the people. Give us give us a bit for this Rebel segment. All right, so let's uh, let's bring James back into the fold here. If he didn't fall asleep. <laughs> and sadly, sadly. I was just on the Twitter feed a couple of minutes ago, and I really don't think that uh, Rogue One won anything at the Oscars. Looks like Jungle Book won the FX. Uh, well, without having seen that movie, all I can say is that the trailers look spectacular. And if it won, it probably deserved it. But yeah, I'd li- it, I would have liked to have seen... Rogue Tarkin, One, man. Tarkin. Yeah, I would like to see those guys get a little bit of of a credit bit for, of love. for yeah for taking a big bold move in bringing two human characters to life via CG like that. Well, it would have been, been nice to see. I, I saw someone tweet something. We live in a world where the TFA and Rogue One didn't get Oscars, but the uh, Suicide Squad did. What are you gonna do? Hello. Ah, there he is. He's back. It's me. I'm back. So, James, we're done. We're we're, we're thinking of calling our Rebels segment Rebels Rundown because we've realized that we don't have a segment name. What do you Uh, think? Alliteration always good. Yeah, no, that's good. Rebels Rundown. I got it. I got something even almost better. The Rebel Yell. (laughs) The Rebel Yell? (laughs) Yeah. Almost better. Billy Idol, man. Come on. The rebel okay. yell. It's uh put. We'll put on the list. It's a poll. It doesn't roll off the tongue. No, it doesn't. Does it? Yeah. Anyway, we're, we're gonna put it to the people. It's it's rebel rundown and rebel yell. Okay, so let's uh, let's get into ads edition for the week here. And we've put this off long enough. Look at this here. We look at this roll along here. Just killing it on the time clock here. No news this week. Who cares? All right, you boys ready to hear from ads? Always. All right, let's do that now. Hello, chaps. Uh, How is everyone? I hope you're all good. A couple of quick questions uh, again this week. So the first one is relating to Star Wars uh, Rebels, uh, but hopefully one that that maybe uh, James can take part in as well. So the wonderful X-Wings... And the fact we haven't yet seen them in Rebels, and obviously they are there, very present in A New Hope. So when do you think and how do you think they will make an appearance? I know that back at Celebration, I think Dave Filoni uh, was interviewed and he said that there was a good chance that they would appear at some point, but he wanted it to be quite a, quite a moment. So 
how do you envisage that storyline going? Uh, and then my second question is more of a um, an observation or, or something that I read uh, recently. The uh, Rogue One film and the links again to Star Wars Rebels. And apparently, and I didn't actually notice this at the time in the cinema, but apparently when the plans are being searched for uh, by Jin and Cassian, they clearly come across something for the dark saber uh, and i wondered if you'd spotted that and what you thought about that as well so that's it for this week uh great show i'm sure and i'll look forward to listening take care bye and there goes ads once again thank you sir hope you're doing well hope your family's doing well uh, thank you for your awesome questions again this week so guys that's actually a pretty good question. We've I, we may have touched on this briefly in the past, uh, but we'll really d- dive into it here. So, when do we think, and how do we think the X Wings will be introduced into Rebels? Because Ads is right, Dave Filoni, I think, pretty strongly, you know, hinted that they would be back, but he wanted to make it a big deal. Um, so James, I don't know if you have any specific thoughts, but I'll, I'll kick it over to you first. Do you, uh, do you have any I'll... thoughts on on how the X Wings will come into the fold? The only thing I'll say on this um, is uh, thanks, Ads, for week after week putting up uh, such great content and awesome questions. But I'll kick it over to the boys uh, for this part of your question because really, you know, I'm so far behind that uh, I think my input is sort of irrelevant. <laughs> no, not really. Come on, man. Well, no, but like I, I don't even I, – I'd be forecasting. They're not there yet, and you guys are so far ahead in the story that like – yeah, but even where we are, they're not there yet. So what he's saying is basically between Rogue One and where we are in Rebels right now. This I don't know where that is. Two, we're probably about two years away from from Rogue One, I believe. Not even. Yeah. And the X Wing still hasn't been introduced yet, but we know it's in Rogue One. Yeah, but I could. Yeah. Uh, I could say like maybe maybe Darth Maul steals one and flies it back in in the scene where Darth Maul comes in. But like, since I have no idea, if, you know what I mean? That's what I'm saying. Like, I well, I has can't. like it's never been introduced. Like, I don't even think it's a ship that exists as of yet in the canon timeline. No, uh, no, it doesn't. So the prototype. So maybe they, maybe. Uh, uh, <laughs> Fantasize, James. Well, I was just—it's funny. <laughs> I was just thinking back to that list we were talking about before of um, uh, plans on the Death Star. Or there sorry, you the, go. Uh, when, when she's looking for uh, all those code names, and the, and we said there's probably a bunch of Easter eggs in there. That's uh, a nice reach. That's a deep cut. Wow, well, it's it's a super 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 deep cut. Um, but yeah, maybe the the plans for some sort of prototype ship could be in there. Yeah, it could be. Why not, Corey? Do you have any thoughts? Theories, fantasies. Yeah, well, I know we we said it's going to be a game changer, the X wing. When it comes in, like first thing I want to say about it, when it comes in, it's going to be awesome. So the pilots that pilot it are going to be like this. This plane is is rocking, and I I want to see Wedge get inside the Tie Fighter for the first time, being like, "I got to get me one of these," kind of deal. You know what I mean? Yeah, that would be cool. Uh, I mean, they, they whenever they do bring them back, they do have to obviously get Wedge in the cockpit. But they've also, I think that's they've got to introduce guys like Porkins and and Biggs, uh, Red Leader, put all these guys back in the fold, right? Right. Now another point to bring up is we still have yet to have had uh, season four confirmed. I think it's kind of in the book, so I think we're all safely assuming that's the case, that there will be a season four, even though there were rumors that season three was it. And who knows, that might still be true, and they might just start a new show. But Yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we'll, we'll wait for celebration for that announcement. That being the case, if we don't get it by the end of season three, it's going to be in the new show, but we had just discussed the point that Dave Filoni had said that at one point we will see it. So there's something to mull over there. 
Wait, you, the think only they, other... you think they would go... do you think they would kill the rebels show in this particular era just to start up a rogue squadron show that occupies the same timeline i don't see it i just <laughs> rebels cannot be wrapped up in three more episodes no so you're definitely you're, you're right i i think there's going to be a season 4 you yeah i would say yes it's it's likely that there will be a season 4 there will be a continuation to this to this uh, uh, somehow. I don't well, think Rogue, this whole thing Rogue will get Rogue Squadron. Rogue Squadron would be up there on my list of if there were to be new shows coming out. Rogue Squadron would be up there, but uh, I guess low hanging fruit or maybe even a deep cut. I don't know. However, you guys take it, but think of it this way: you know, we got Sabine Wren, MIA, Wild Card, uh, Weapons Specialist. Maybe that's the turning tide that she comes in with. You know, we don't know where the X wing came from. Uh, well, uh, doesn't really like like look like Mandalorian design. But we do know the maybe... factory or the company that makes them. I think it's Incom or something like that. But, but your who... point still stands. Maybe if, Sabine yeah, brings Sabine... that to the game. You know, like I'm a weapons person. Like, check this plane out. Yeah, because I think the Mandalorians fly th- those ships. I think, if I'm not mistaken, they're called Houndstooths. Uh, but mm. maybe they do fly in the X. Isn't the Houndstooth Bosk ship? Ah, oh, maybe. I don't know. Good lord. I'm gonna, I want to get Wesley. Wesley mad. Oh shit! Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Sorry, dude. I don't want to make a mistake on on Bosk trivia. Yeesh. <laughs> Uh, you know, back when we first talked about this, I think it was in the summer, early fall. It was definitely well in advance of Rogue One, and I, you know, I had visions in my head at the, at the time of X wings making their entrance, sort of like uh, in in Tora Tora Tora, with the ships sort of flying on the horizon, and they would just come kind of like ripping in and and bombing some sort of Imperial installation or or just tearing through. Uh, a, a squadron of TIE fighters or something like that. And then, of course, we, that's how we got introduced to them in Rogue One. So I thought, well, th- there goes that intro in Rebels. I guess they still could, but it would seem redundant. Uh, so now uh, my theory has kind of reverted or evolved, I guess. <clears throat> so we, we, we know that the, the Empire is working on these TIE defenders, which are these ridiculous looking three pronged TIE fighter looking things. I think as we get to the season three finale, those ships are going to be deployed. We've seen them in the trailers. And I think they're going to prove a handful for the meager A-wings and Y-wings of the Rebellion that we've seen. And they yeah, will be... That's the project on Lothal. Correct. Uh, so I, I think those ships will like decimate the Rebel fleet. And so going into season four... Uh, if we do indeed get it, uh, the rebels will say, you know, "We we need a better ship. We need something. Yeah, we need we need a response. We yeah we our our, our crappy Y wings and A wings can't fight these these crazy Imperial Tie fighters." And then, you know, enter the X wing. I think that's that's one way it makes an appearance. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely. I don't know if it's if it's going to be this season. I'll say it's through Sabine. Which is a bit of a reach, but yeah, I I really do hope we get to see it in Rebels, or maybe even this new animated show that Dave Filoni has been talking about. But I, I it's got to be through Rebels. It just corresponds with the timeline, and I I'd, I'd feel a bit robbed. I'd feel a bit robbed if we didn't get to see the X Wing in Rebels in this timeline. Okay, so we got another question from Ads here, uh, specifically from Rogue One. When when uh, Cassian and Jin are after the Death Star plans, uh, Project Stardust, uh, we see a bunch of other project names that Ads listed off. Um, so, did you guys make note of any of them, or have any thoughts about what they're for? I mean, there is an answer to this for the most part. Um, yeah. I think Corey did a little digging. I didn't. I mean, I remember when I saw the movie, I remember thinking like, oh, they've probably like put in some, I don't know, if, you know, kids' birthdays, producers' kids' birthdays or 
you know, inside jokes or some sort of Easter eggs in there. Maybe plot related, maybe not. Uh, but I never, I never looked it up. I think Corey's got more answers into that. But I, that's what I was referring to before when I said uh, for the X-wing uh, plans, maybe they steal them from that list, or maybe you know, steal them. Maybe, maybe the they were listed there. I should say maybe that's you know, just a yeah. I mean, some of the names uh, there, there was uh, Dark Saber. Or no, sorry, I. I had some mentioned Dark Saber, but they they call it Black Saber, I think, in Rogue One. I'm gonna guess they're one and the same. Which I, maybe spells a bad end. Maybe if if the Empire now has their hands on the Black Saber, that would or be just because cool. it's a Black Saber plan. Maybe that's just like the how to, you know. Doesn't mean they have it. No, you're right. It doesn't mean they have it. Um, yeah, there was Pax Orion, uh, Mark Omega. Uh, geez, and those all came to mind. Um, and I think for the most part, what those things are, uh, and readers of, of people who read Catalyst will know that the project, for example, that Galen worked on was, I, I think, Project Stardust. But that was, the, the whole Death Star construction was, was sort of subdivided into a ton of different covert operations across the galaxy. So there was one. Wasn't there one that was under the umbrella of? Uh, there was one that was. Uh, what was it called now? Uh, it was like an energy thing. I can't remember now. Well, <laughs> we, we we haven't seen Rogue One in a while, so. No, it was in Catalyst. Well, I like when Galen like he, he, was that? <laughs> it's been a while since I read Catalyst too. Yeah, it was just he—he he thought he was working for someone else at first, you know. Yeah, no, I mean, all—all all this to say is, I—I I, I think the main answer is the names that we saw in Rogue One, I think, are subdivided projects for the Death Star. You know, whether it's propulsion, or uh, one of them, one of them, I'm pretty sure had to do with like the the exterior cladding for the Death Star. You know, one of them could have been for for life support, for example. Uh, we know Stardust was the laser. I, I think that's probably the answer. And of course, I'm sh- you know, obviously they had two towers full of those things. So who knows how many different plans are in there? Uh, but I think in the context of this question, most of it was Death Star related. But yeah, ones like the Black Saber. That could be it. Could be the the Dark Saber, or it could be a, a completely unrelated project. So Corey, Corey you did some digging. Before. Why don't you like burst our balloon now? There's, yeah, I really didn't find anything. I just found some things kind of interesting. Uh, you had mentioned, Kyle, most of the things here are most likely projects of the Death Star, like just being divvied out and people are being told that they're doing different things that aren't exactly true. We've talked about the Black Saber in the past, that being the most interesting. I would love to think that it has to do with the Dark Saber. But just a few things that came to mind, like, uh, the stellar sphere. You you saw? Did you see that? Like, I, yeah, I had to Google You're it. You're right. That's a, that's that's one of them. I I, I get confused with that because if you watch Disney Junior, that's that's something from like Miles from Tomorrowland. Exactly. That's my note <laughs> that I have here. It's Miles from Tomorrowland. Um, I googled Mark Omega, and I I got something kind of interesting here. Listen to this, Mark. Omega is an optional super boss in Final Fantasy. It is considered one of the toughest bosses in the game. It's a gigantic mimic found in the deepest reaches of the Great Crystal. So I just thought that whole Great Crystal thing kind of awkwardly or coincidentally tied it all together. I was like, wow, maybe it was a nod to a favorite video game of one of the writers. Yeah, exactly. It could be. I mean... Of course. I mean, I'm I'm sure some of them are just completely throwaway things, inside jokes. Yeah, that's usually. I mean, if you're gonna put in, if you're gonna have to create these codes, why not like put in some numbers that mean something to you? Somebody, somebody's in, you know, like uh, network security code from from Disney is on there. They're like, ha ha ha, it's on screen. They could access all my files. <laughs> <laughs> Another one quickly, the first thing that came to my mind, again, like I had to look at a list of uh, like uh, Easter eggs to see a list of 
what those what was in that room that Jin and Cassian were going through. But there was another thing called Pax Aurora, which when I heard the word Pax, it, it reminded me instantaneously of uh, Serenity, the movie. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's this biological weapon that in the movie called Pax. Like, it's not a weapon, actually. They, they try and p- pacify the population with this chemical, and it ends up kind of turning them in, not zombies, but these people called the Reavers which are, like, horrible, horrible. Every, I think everybody listening to this has probably seen it, knows exactly what you're talking about. I'm probably the mo- the least informed. So and I don't, I don't really care. I, either way, when I, when I saw the word <laughs> PAX, that made me, it made me think of that, you know, like, biological warfare, kind of. That's a, th- like, a shout-out to Firefly. Again, could very well be. But again, I, I think the roundabout, simple, short answer is, is most are tied to the Death Star somehow. And uh, that's it. Ads, I hope I hope that answers your question. I hope we gave you something new there that you hadn't already known. Uh, but uh, thank you again, and I, I can't wait to hear what you've got planned for us next week. Yeah, Ads is the man. I say it every week. That's just my catchphrase. We should just rename it Ads is the man. Yeah, I love that guy. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody loves ads. Uh and now we we've got uh, a message from our good friend Rob Williams over at Generation X Wing who Rob has embarked on a project uh to join the 501st out his way in in Victoria BC and he's building a, himself a biker scout costume and he's documenting that on Outer Rim Rookie. So if you're subscribed to uh, Gen X, Gen, Generation X Wing podcast, which you should be, if you listen to this show, you should. Um, then you already know. Uh, but if you don't, and you want to hear firsthand what it's like for a complete newbie, total noob, to join the Five Hundred First, what it takes to build a costume, uh, the sacrifice, the details, the costs, all that stuff, uh, you need to check out. Follow Rob. Get all the details from him, and uh, it, it's really been cool so far. He's posted a couple YouTube videos. Really cool stuff, but... Uh, yeah, the Outer Rim Rookie. Check it out, and uh, for now, we're going to hear what he's got to say this week. Hey there, Tumbling Saber crew. It's Rob Williams from the Generation X-Wing podcast. I got a question for you guys. So as fans, we always ask everybody, what order do you put your movies in? What's your favorite? What's your least favorite Star Wars movie? But what commonly gets left out is the Clone Wars movie. It had a theatrical release. It did come out. It's on Rotten Tomatoes, all that jazz. So why do we not include this movie? Why is it that we seem to omit this? Is it because it's an animation? Is it because it wasn't very good? Is it because reasons? So I make my question basically is, why do we leave out this movie when we rank our favorite movies? My other question for you guys is, uh, would you rather, maybe you can leave us for Sith to Servers, would you rather take out all the chocolate in your diet, or would you rather take out all the bread in your diet. This is someone that someone came up to me and asked me this question. I will not say if it's my doctor or not, but that's my would you rather. All right. Thank you very much. And I will talk to you guys later. Bye. All right, Rob. Thank you, sir. It's very, very nice to hear from you on the show and keep doing what you're doing over at Gen X wing. Love your show appointment listening each week. Uh, so guys, we're talking about the clone wars animated movie and an often overlooked piece of star Wars canon. Um, and maybe with good reason, I don't know. Uh, it was a movie that came out in 2008 and had a grand domestic total of $35 million at the box office. Uh, so not the typical number we're used to seeing from Star Wars properties. Uh, but again, this was the first venture into animated stuff on the big screen. And um, when you add in the, the, the international totals, it had a total gross of... 68 million dollars again nothing nothing too uh spectacular to to write home about although i don't know what the budget was but i i cory i assume that you've seen this movie james have you seen it i have not i don't know that you need to bother really um it's okay a lot of people don't like it and i see i can see why the series it was this was the kickoff to the animated series and I, I I think it fell at a weird time. 
You know, it came on the, it was three years after Revenge of the Sith was out. And I think a lot of people at that time were, in their minds anyway, were done with Star Wars. And so to relaunch it with this animated thing was sort of a, I'll say risky proposition, but uh, it failed to capture audiences, I think, in the way that they, they had hoped. Or maybe it did. I don't know. But I'm, you know, I'm just looking at these totals and, and I'm kind of underwhelmed. I didn't know it did this poorly at the box office. According to Google, it made 8.5 million. I mean, it cost 8.5 million U.S. Okay, so it's not a it was, failure. It, it wasn't a failure. I, it made them money for sure. And it, it launched off um, you know, a wildly successful animated series that lasted five, six seasons. So overall, I mean, we can't complain about what, it, it, its footprint. But Rob was right. When we talk about you know, rank, your, rank your favorite Star Wars movies, this one just generally is left completely off the list. And even I leave it off the list because I'm fairly certain that the people I'm talking to when when we have these conversations, typical barroom stuff, is not going to be spoken about either. Uh, so, Corey, why why do you think people leave this off? Well, first first and foremost, uh, I want to say big props to Rob because I've been thinking about that a lot lately too, and I wanted to catch you guys on cis disturbers at one point saying like, I'd be like, oh yeah, eight theatrical le- releases, and then you guys would try and bust me, and I'd be like, no, the Clone Wars, bleh. Like I'm pretty sure that would have happened. So wait, <laughs> you had this thing in the you had this thing in your back pocket, like a loophole that you could have pulled out. Now you just ruined it. Well, well like now now that it's out there, now you know, like you know, <laughs> like it always gets like Rob's saying it's swept under the rug. This movie, uh, there's there's definitely probably a number of reasons for it. Like Kyle mentioned a good one. It's three years. It's a, it's a very weird time period. Three years after Revenge of the Sith. A lot of Star Wars fans are still kind of jaded as to the what happened in the prequels. Um, again, the movie itself, not that great. The hype, the buildup, not there. Just kind of dropped on us. Uh, like, I even remember myself, like, I think it was even in theater. And I didn't, like, I didn't go see it in theater. What kind of fan is... are you? I-, I was there opening night. Where were you? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm not. I, I have my ticket stub. Wow. Yeah, I can show. I can. I should find it and show it to you. I hope I'm not talking out of my rear end again. I'm pretty sure I have my ticket stub. No, I believe no, you. Either do. way, that that that's pretty impressive. You should have invited me. But I I remember not really being, not even necessarily aware. I was probably obviously doing a lot of other stuff at that time. But just I don't know. I I've seen the movie. And again, I'll even say this about the first season of the Clone Wars, or at least the first five to six episodes, the first disc, it really had a bit of a hard time finding itself. And it took a couple of seasons to really hit its stride. Hmm, and like, I, once it did, I like... I, do I agree? I don't know if I, Well, I think you're right. I mean, it takes any show a while to hit its stride and get, get rid of the bambi leg effect, which I think this movie is plenty guilty of. Like, it was very Bambi-legged and unsure how to approach these characters in this and the format. which just wasn't that great. Yeah, I it mean, the whole thing so- about about the plot with Jabba the Hutt's little baby, and yeah, that was very tacky. It was very yeah. much aimed at an audience you would expect to aim an, an animated movie at. Uh, but it had, some, I mean, it had some good action, both, you know, lightsaber battles, uh, space action, ground battle stuff. It had some really neat stuff. Just and yeah, the, the overall up, plot was a bit tacky. It set up a bit of what the galaxy was going through at that time. Like what, what the Clone Wars, a lot of it is, is the Republic versus the Separatists. And they're all vying for these neutral planets kind of, you know? So they're, they're trying to get the huts on their side and the, the Separatists are trying to do the same by setting the Jedi up and whatnot. But yeah, just, Fell very. I I have it. I think I bought it for like three bucks used, years and years ago, but just really fell short. It, 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 again, I it, it felt it was like trying to find itself. Like the 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 more this show goes on, the more it finds its audience audience and is kind of playing to that. Like it's it's all those things. It wasn't very good. Uh, it's animated, which I think people are. By by nature, maybe less interested in unless you're a kid. 
I think the and, only other genre that people frown on more is musical. It just animated just turns off so many adults when it really should. Yeah. No, it really shouldn't. It's just a way of really intensifying storytelling. Well, you can you can yeah, paint you pictures. To... You just can't easily paint with traditional. You know. Yeah, you, you can paint pictures that you can't film. That's it. And I mean, when you look at what even even back then, I mean, this is almost ten years ago now, but. Pixar was doing amazing stuff then, so I don't know why. I don't know if the the animation stigma is really fair, uh, but I I think there a lot of it is because of the timing of it. I I think a lot of Star Wars fans were were in that mindset of Star Wars. Is, I'm I'm like I'm disengaged. It's over. I'm I'm having a hard time getting back into this. Yeah, that's a big part of it too. I think. Well, and I also I think that their fan base is from the generation of like cartoons were from Saturday mornings and were for kids. And so like there's a disconnect, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and and Corey what you said is that you know it it's probably suffering from the prequelitis thing. Like I didn't like the prequels and this movie's got all the characters from the prequels and it's animated and I'm disengaged. I'm not going. And the hype too. Like put this movie in a different time period like Put it at the time where, say, the Clone Wars is never made, and Disney says, "Okay, we're snatching up Lucasfilm in 2012, and we're starting this whole thing with a Shebang animated series." People would have ate it up, and it would have been so amazing. Well, if they it, let's say this movie had never existed, and they just launched the Clone Wars animated series as they did, and I think in the fall of 2008, maybe it was 2009. I think that would have been the safer bet. Just and then, and then the you give the people what they want. Like once Disney buys Lucasfilm, then they could have ended the Clone Wars with a movie. Mm, I think that totally. movie does a lot better. Yeah. I like that. What scares me now is because the numbers game that Disney plays is because of what happened with this movie. And again, like the way we're breaking it down, they can break it down too and say this is why it didn't work. But it it scares me in the sense that they're dissuaded from making future possible possible future animated movies, which I would love to see. I'd love like, to see it. Yeah, man, and I think they would do so good too, like really well in theater. Like, really oh, well. would certainly do better now. I mean, again, yeah. I don't know if if Lucasfilm considered a, a close to seventy million dollar box office take. I don't know if they consider that a failure, considering they only put eight and a half into the movie. I don't think you can consider it a failure as as far as an ROI goes. No, you can't. Because, like, look at the way you're, like, r- ratio-wise, they did really well. <laughs> but, I mean, when, again, think of it this way. I, I think The Force Awakens made $35 million one night. Different time, yes. That Again, it was, like, seven, eight years later. But still. <laughs> One night is what it took for The Force Awakens to equal yeah, but, all of what The Clone Wars did. Yeah, budget too. Ratios. Yeah, no, it, it, I, it, I think financially it's it's all good. Um, and uh, I, The last thing I'll say on this, uh, before we get to Rob's brain-melting question, is um, I think part of it, again, is the reason why people don't rank it because everybody would rank it last anyway, I think. And so it just kind of is understood <laughs> that it's at the end. So you just don't even mention it. Like it would, it would be at the bottom of my list. I mean, I don't hate it. It's, but it's definitely at the bottom of my list. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I see what you're saying there, but I totally understand the sense, uh, Rob's question in the sense that, it's almost as if it's ignored completely. Like it's not even taken into account. Like it's like they're treating it like it's a holiday special. Almost like when we say three theatrical releases, we're look like, people seven, 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 but no, it's actually eight. But no one ever mentions it. It's just totally swept under the rug. Well, and, and look at the release date too. It's it was released in the middle of August. That's not typically when you would release. A summertime blockbuster. I mean, this is almost back to school time. You know, big movies drop in June, July, May. They don't come in August. I don't think. Maybe I'm, again, I could be talking out of my ass again, but I don't think that's when you drop your big summertime movie. 
So I, no, I think the timing of this poorly was, planned, or maybe not. Maybe it was exactly planned this way for a very specific reason. You know, just warming us up for that eventual fall release of the of episode one, season one. I mean, this is this is a long time ago now, and you know, I'm I'm happy we got all this stuff, but. I would be lying to you if if I said I knew all the specific history behind the, the making of it and the planning of it. No clue. Um. So Rob, there you go. That's that's our thoughts on the Clone Wars. Uh, and as to your Sith disturbery question, we're going to answer that now because we haven't actually finalized our schedule, our recording schedule for the week. And just in case, uh, James is heading overseas in a few days here. And we need to record James's thoughts on this for posterity. So um, <laughs> the record needs to know. James, would you rather remove, if your doctor said you have to remove chocolate or bread from your diet, and I'm, I'm assuming Rob means bread in all its forms. So loaves, uh, breakfast cereals, uh, pizza dough, bagels, all that stuff. It's, got, it's all got to go from your diet or chocolate. And in all of its forms, where are you going? What's coming out? Uh, this isn't, I mean, this isn't an easy question, but it's not as hard as for me as it would be for my wife. She would, I think she would just jump out the doc, uh, hope the, the doctor's office was on the sixth floor or higher and just leap out the window. <laughs> um, but when four for, floors won't do. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, four floors just hurts. Um, but. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I think for me, it's, it's, it's relatively easy. I mean, I would miss chocolate a lot. I really would. I like chocolate. But bread, man. Whew. You're taking out bread out of your diet. That, that I, pasta. No, I, could live without, uh, I could live without sandwiches. Even Easily. if it was just loaves, I would still choose bread, I think. But I mean, when you, I, I, I'm not even including pasta, but like, you know, hamburger yeah, you buns did, and all, you, you know, bread and all that. You said bread. Well, is, is, does pasta go in that category? No. 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 Just because no? it's like, no. I'm, right. I'm on 100% on the same page as James. No question whatsoever. But does like, it change? Miss- does it change if pasta is part of it? No, I guess that just makes it easier, right? Yes. Yeah. Just makes I'm it easier. A, yeah, I, I like chocolate. I'd miss chocolate. I'm I'm more of a dark chocolate kind of guy, but I prefer chips to chocolate, and I'm definitely a sandwich, burger, sub, mm. all that good yumminess, man. Like, no. Bread Garlic is bread? Like, oh, come on. Toast with your eggs? Chocolate's for the weak. <laughs> <laughs> James, you just called your wife weak. Um, well, the, chocolate's the, more of the an lady, iconic the, sort the of snack. The good, benevolent lady who scored you <laughs> tragically hip tickets, you called her weak. Hey, my wife's weak, your wife's weak, and your wife's weak. And Candace could care less about chocolate. Really? Nope. She, she, this question would be a, a complete and utter joke to her. Like it's not even, You wouldn't even ask her this question because she does not what? care about chocolate. Everyone's got to love bread. Come on. Bread. Yeah, I mean, get it. I, w- with much regret, I would have to have to say goodbye to chocolate. With much regret, oh my god! I mean, I'm yeah, I'm looking at my on. my little pile here of, oh, you hear that? My Reese's peanut butter cups. Oh, they're gone. No more. No more. No, I'd miss it. That's for damn sure. But goddamn, I love me a hoagie. Yeah, I, uh, geez, I got to agree. How, how do you feel about this weird trend of of Doing away with the bread and wrapping it in lettuce instead. I mean, is that is that fair or foul? It's actually pretty good. It's depending, I tried it at PF Chang's with, you know, you get a nice lettuce leaf, and they had like a, it was uh, like a minced meat almost, and you kind of just. Slam well, no, that I mean, in that's, there I think that, I up. think that's a traditional thing. That that doesn't count. I mean, like if you go to, like Subway or something, it's Dagwood. Dagwood. Right? Dagwood does like... it right. You could replace the bread with, uh, a lettuce wrap. Yeah, whatever. It's nice. It's, it's, it's apples and oranges, man. Yeah, it's a nice option to have, but co- you know, call it a lettuce wrap, but don't call it a sandwich. Or I mean, call it a sandwich, but like, 
it's for me it's it's those are two separate things some days i may crave a lettuce wrap thing um but not on the same day i want a sandwich like that wouldn't that wouldn't satiate the uh the, the sandwich urge for me i don't think the bread is a big part of a sandwich yeah you you get that urge for for like those easy carbs right that come with a sandwich yeah and i i like the sound of like a, a, maybe a tuna wrapped uh salad wrap lettuce wrapped uh, tuna sandwich sounds delicious yeah, I think that sounds pretty good. I, I guess it's fair. It's weird to me. I mean, you could never have like a warm sandwich wrapped in lettuce because then your your lettuce would just go limp yeah. and wilty. That That's foul. Well, unless that, you that, had that, a styrofoam container that had two sides where you could keep your hot side hot and your cold side cold. Hmm. I definitely learned that early good on. Point. When, when you want to make a good sandwich, <laughs> I, I've separated my, my veggies and built on the spot. You know what I mean? If you want to warm something up, you got to construct on the spot. You can't just leave it all. You're right about that. Together. Do you think I flew that reference over Corey's head? <laughs> I, I, I don't know because he is a few years younger than we are. Say it again. Yeah, I did. Well, the, I McD- don't know. I'm four, the McDLT I'm was a big in. sandwich for like two years at, at McDonald's. It had it had a hot side and a cold side and a special container made of styrofoam. Yeah, remember the McDLT? You got to remember McDLT. that. McDLT. And George know. Costanza did the did the ad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he knows oh, yeah. it through, through Seinfeld. <laughs> <laughs> he's like walking through the streets, and he's so happy. Yeah, he's doing like this tap dance. We just poisoned Rob. Poor Rob. We can't. We, we poisoned poor Rob's question with Seinfeld. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Feel the hate. <laughs> oh, jeez. Okay. Uh, I think it's a clean sweep. We would all say goodbye to chocolate, though. I I, I would do so f- very tearfully. I'm okay with it. <laughs> I would not be. <laughs> See, that's that's, funny, that's like... my problem because usually people are either I'm a sweets guy or I'm a I'm a salty guy. I'm a both. I get I get I get the the salt and sugar demon in me. It's it's terrible. Oh, it's so awesome. I can pound back chocolate and then rip open a bag of of chips and crush both. I'm like that too. And the problem is you eat like you, you, so you eat your salt and you're like, oh, too much salt. So you open your bag of M&Ms and you eat those because like, oh, sugar. And then you're like, oh, too sweet. So then you go back to the chips to like well, balance and, it and out. It's, <laughs> it's, it's disturbing. Like I, I read this book, Salt, Sugar, Fat, a long time ago. It is so disturbing how calculated that whole thing is. Oh, it's I'm sure. drugs. It's completely designed to make you do that. It's so yummy. Oh, it's so good. Oh. <laughs> what did, what did it get? Is how when I was a kid, I would like I'd be sitting there on the counter watching my mom whip something that's all chocolatey and it's gonna be on a cake and muffins, whatever it is, and I would sit there waiting for those whippers, man, and I'd just like lick those things clean. Like chocolate, 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 man. Like I was all chocolate all the time. And then at one day I was just like my parents they would use this to us all the time. If you don't eat your dinner, you're not getting dessert. I'd be like, eh, whatever, I don't care. I'll be like, okay, I'm gonna eat. Like, I want my dessert. Yeah, I would. I would choke back whatever food I was being forced to eat. I, I'm gonna have my Swiss roll. I love Swiss yeah. rolls. Meanwhile, I'm watching Star Wars on the couch. <laughs> well, there you go, Rob. <laughs> a long-winded answer to a very straight question that we all answered in the same way, but still gave you what uh, ten minutes out of that. There you go. Do come again, Rob. Thank you so much for the question. Love yeah, great seriously. questions. Thank you. I love I, I I for some reason I really like answering the non Star Wars stuff. Yeah, it's fine, a little off topic. Not that we like to go off topic. <laughs> never. No. We never tangent. Uh but um uh, if anybody wants to send us non Star Wars stuff, we probably like to answer that too. It's gotta pass a quality inspection. QA. <laughs> The QA department's got to give it a sniff first. Yeah, come on. Ah, oh, fair enough. We'll we'll send that up to the QA department then. All right, everybody. Uh, anything anything else on the agenda, guys? Corey, I, 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 did you want to talk about toys or something, or do you want to no, save that for t- another day? Yeah, I'll save it for another day. We're 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 going pretty long here. All right, fair enough. Um, well, James, uh, this is your last recording for a couple weeks, so, um, 
we'll say goodbye to you and say goodbye to the people here. Yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, have fun on the next couple of shows. I'll be gallivanting about Europe, uh, chasing about 60 uh, secondary four and five students as they come out of their shells and go exploring for the first time. It's, it's really actually a really fun time. I've done it a couple of times already, and uh, it's, it's a great experience. For sure, man. You're going you're gonna to share a moment with those kids. Oh, yeah, it's great. It's good, it's good to just hang out with the kids sort of in a, you know, outside of the school context because you get to relate with them in a, in a bit of a different way. It's less, uh, it's less, stri- less straight up authoritarian. We get to give them some, you know, some freedoms. They get to go do some exploring on their own. And it's funny to see what they sort of choose to do with their time. If you, you get these kids that you think would be, you know, that, that, that seem so, you know, tough or, or whatever image they project. And then you find out they went, they went to the ballet. Well, they had four free hours in, Pal- in Paris or whatever, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's fun. And you'll also be, we mentioned it before, but for those who may have forgotten or maybe if you're listening for the first time, James is going to be checking out Lake Como in Italy, which is, of course, where Anakin and Padme tied the knot. So, yeah. We'll, we'll expect some nice photos from that region of Italy. I'll try to recreate. Yeah. I'll try to get uh, myself and maybe one of the other chaperones, my buddy Steve, who's also got a pretty good beard. We'll try to re- maybe bringing... re- recreate one of the poses, you know? Oh, are you that bringing a camera? camera? Am I going to bring a camera? Just... What are you? <laughs> what your year is this? Who are you? Am I going to bring a camera? Yeah, like a real <laughs> camera so you can actually take nice pictures. Yeah, yeah. I'll have I'll have my phone and I'll have a legit like Canon camera. That's amazing. <laughs> well, I'd say most people rely on their phones. What do you want me to say? Like, no, no, I, you know, uh, you, you, you're going to Lake Como, bro. Like, you weren't more specific, but yeah, no, I, I'm going to be in Venice. I'm going to be in Cinque Terre. I'm going to be in Barcelona. Like, I, oh, I'm going to yeah, have the, get... the opportunity for lots of epic shots, so I'll have the gear. Yeah, get that wide angle, man. Yep. Oh, yeah, I can't wait, guys. I'll be, I'll be, uh, I'll be thinking of you when I'm in Como, and I'll, you know what? I'll try to like, I'll try to send you guys something for the show, some somehow show related while I'm there. Well, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, man. Yeah, so James, we will will certainly miss you over the, over the couple of weeks that you're gone. Yeah, I'm sure I'll miss it. It's it's uh it's become a, a fun habit. So uh, have fun, boys. I'll be back. It, in it, no it time. is weird, right? As tired as this whole thing makes us, when we're not doing it, we're missing it. Yeah, we we, we postponed or whatever last week, and Corey and I were chatting at the the, the regular time, saying like, "Hey, man, <laughs> this is weird." <laughs> it's become such a fixture in our schedule yeah uh, but anyway uh, thanks ads again once again I, I don't know how many consecutive episodes you've delivered for us but uh, we owe you a debt of gratitude and Rob at Gen X thank you sir and keep doing what you're doing over there at uh, at the podcast and with the Outer Rim Rookie loving your content as usual and uh, go check out StarWarsCommonwealth.com and check out the other podcasts there Talk Star Wars the Nerd Room, the Skyhoppers, the Rogue Squadron Podcast, and of course, uh, the aforementioned Gen X Wing. Uh, if you want to leave us a review, as you see, we'll, we've read a few of them over the last couple of weeks, which was has been a real thrill. Really appreciate those. It really gives us a nice, uh, I guess, validation that people are actually listening to and enjoying the show. So uh, drop us a review there, and we will definitely try not to read it six weeks after you put it there. <laughs> Congrats again to Matt Keegan. Matt Keegan yeah, is and, the man. Yeah, welcome to the knighthood. And again, check out DJ Mopar 318 on Instagram. That is the Instagram account of one Matt Keegan. And you can see some of the sketches that he's drawn there. Uh, just stupid, staggering stuff. It's Amazing. incredible. I've just started flipping through it since you told me. It's incredible. Hey, real quick, like just answer this on the fly. If you were going to commission a, a character from Star Wars, who would you pick? Hmm. Wow. Vader. That's 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 hard hard to argue. Corey. Ahsoka. Ahsoka. Yeah, Ahsoka's a good one. Cool. Ahsoka and Vader. I think that's even better. There you go. You said one. <laughs> loophole. I'm the loopholer. <laughs> oh, there we go. A late minute entry into the uh, what are we going to call this episode sweepstakes? Uh, and again, guys, if you want to check us out on other social media avenues, uh, Corey, where can we find you on Twitter? Come on, man. Everybody knows you can find me at Chop Rules with a Z. And James, where are you at? Still hanging around at Tommy Bombadil 1. 
Excellent. I'm at Tumbling Saber, and you can also find us on Facebook and on Instagram. Love to interact with you there. And uh, otherwise, guys, it's going to be a, I'm not sure what, what you're going to see in your feed this week. You're going to get this episode of the podcast, of course. And uh, whether you get a Sith Disturbers or a Journals of the Willing, uh, well, that's going to be a surprise to be seen later in the week. Uh, but that's it for now. I hope you guys can have a, had a great weekend and going to have a great week. And I hope there's more Star Wars news to talk about coming up soon. And uh, we'll talk to you again very shortly. So have a good one, and we'll see you soon. Watching you walking away from me. Worry.